to infinity and beyond. This is me. This is how I win. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! You're a wizard, Harry. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. No. I am the father. Hasta la vista, baby. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Hello, everyone. Welcome back inside the film room. Zach Goins here with Johnny Sobchak once again for what is quite possibly the most exciting episode we have had in some time. I know we just had Jake Lawler on, so no no shots fired at Jake for a lack of excitement there. But Johnny, we were talking about the Batman today, and what more could you ask for? I mean, we've been waiting for so long, and it's here, and it's it delivered. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we have a lot to say about it and we're going to be talking about it for a good bit of this episode. So I'm not going to go into much detail now, but saying it delivered, I feel is almost an under, I mean, it is an understatement, I think, at least for me. So, um, and, man, I am so excited to talk about this and just, I've been thinking about it all day, as we were saying, and saw it last night, just about, um, and I'm going to be seeing it again tomorrow and I, uh, I can't wait. And I, I kind of teed myself up there by saying, what more could you ask for than a Batman review? But we're, we are delivering even more to you because Johnny had the privilege this week to once again sit down with Donald Mowat from Dune, the hair and makeup artist who has done so many brilliant things, the Oscar-nominated hair and makeup finally. artist. We can finally give him his, his flowers there. And hopefully we can soon say Oscar-winning hair and makeup artist but johnny got to chat with him the interview will be at the end of this episode after we talk through the batman so we've got the uh the battinson fans on the front half the dune hive on the back half what an episode for our audience yeah it's a it's a good one absolutely um and yeah i mean you said it most one of the most exciting in a while i think we're just going to be giddy as hell the whole time and i was certainly giddy talking to donald finally getting to sit down with him again uh post dune getting the touch on all things arrakis um and uh looking forward to what he has coming up in his schedule as well so um yeah i'm very excited and uh let's just let's dive right into it man yeah i mean we we had been johnny and i both saw it we're recording on wednesday night so johnny and i both saw the batman on tuesday night at the fan event the imax event uh and had a, a lengthy phone call afterwards just like <laughs> chatting just like twitter wasn't enough texting wasn't enough we just had to get those thoughts out there and uh, that, that's really laid the foundation for what we're going to talk about on the podcast today. But uh, we both texted each other throughout the day today, having seen it last night, and both had the same overall feeling of, oh my God, I haven't been able to stop thinking about this movie, like throughout the work day. Like, I don't know about you, I was over here blaring the Batman score <laughs> all day long <laughs> while I was doing my work. So it's been top of mind. I know we want to get down into it. We are cutting the news segment this week because we have that big interview, because we have a Batman review, but we still are going to touch on the what's going on because there's been a lot that's happened uh, since you, Johnny, were on the last podcast. I know we had Jake filling in last week while you were away, but Mm. one of the biggest things that's happened, we don't have to spend too much time on it, but in the TV world, a lot has happened. Personally, I've finished quite a few shows this last week. I finished... Righteous Gemstones came to an end, the second season on HBO Max. Uh, The After Party on Apple TV, the finale aired, which just got picked up for season two. Very exciting for that. Both of those shows, great comedies and really elevated stuff. My my continuation with the OC, I finally finished season three, which is a horrifying, traumatic ending there that uh, rocked the world (laughs) back in 2006. I've been catching up with some people who saw it in real time and, and just having someone to understand my trauma. (laughs) <laughs> and the biggest of those is the finale of season two of Euphoria, which 
is uh, there, there's a lot to, to discuss there. Uh, just a lot of a, a lot going on, which is seems to be like the tagline of Euphoria. But <laughs> this show, anyone who's listened to the podcast knows how how beloved season one is for Johnny and I, and we kind of touched on it throughout the weeks of season two that it was started off strong, had some good episodes a little up and down and but for the most part I feel like the last time we really like d- dove into the show we were still like very high on it but these last couple episodes and the finale even were just I don't know about you but it, it was like a, a steep decline uh the last uh, definitely in the la- in the finale but just just nonsensical stuff it breaks my heart nonsensical stuff yeah um no, you're, I mean, you're spot on there. Reagan and I were talking about it quite a bit last night. We were having a, kind of a little breakdown. I think we were having a mental uh, like disconnect from uh, just what we were seeing, what we were hearing in this, this Euphoria season two finale. After what was such a fantastic season of television, not this season, but season one, um, which she saw prior to me seeing it. She kind of put me on. She loved it. Uh, I loved it. Watched it a couple times prior to season two. And uh, I, I really, it's hard to fathom how just off the deep end this has really gone. I mean, we went from pre, what was, I thought, prestige level TV on HBO, which HBO is known for. And it was like, it was like going from season, you know, one or, you know, the, the peak seasons of Game of Thrones to season eight but in the span of one season rather than like six. Not even, um, not even. It was in the span of like three episodes. An episode, yeah. Because like, like, I, like I said, I was still like very into this season and like it had its Agreed. issues, but I was Agreed. still like enjoying it along the way. You know, yeah. like there, there was plenty to, of like great moments and even like great episodes. Like the, I don't remember what number it is, but like the frantic Rue episode where she's running all yes. over town. That one was, that was, fantastic i really love the the season premiere as well but yeah. like some of the Agreed. stuff that we got later um was just this i mean i want to just focus on the finale because that's obviously like the hot conversation and, uh, and uh what's what's top of mind right now but the the whole lexi's play like i loved lexi getting a lot more screen time this season and i love fexy Agreed. so much but uh <laughs> the the splitting the whole like last two episodes into this play and then uh uh, the ashtray stuff like like in what world does the euphoria police department um are they this invested in the disappearance of a drug dealer if anything they should be like celebrating that that mouse is gone that this drug dealer has has disappeared and isn't causing them problems anymore but instead right. they're sending a full SWAT team to, to try and figure this <laughs> out. And, and, oh ashtray, and Ashtray, like we finally got Faye to step up and shout yeah. out to her. That was a good, that was really good. Um, love to see that. But then Ashtray just like. It was a little psycho- too late though, right? Like it was, it was a little too, well, little too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Faye, Faye was a little too late, but then like her intention was there and it was clear that she was like choosing the side with Fez and Ash but yeah. then like I don't understand why Fez wasn't just like Ash stop he didn't have to give any details away yeah. uh, while the phone was recording but just the the Scarface sequence there was was brutal and not was... in like a emotionally brutal just like in a idiotic brutal yeah it was not I mean it was <sighs> It was Sam Levinson desperately wanting to do a shootout scene um, because it's just complete and utter nonsense. And this, I swear to God, yes, the Lexi play. I love Lexi. I think she's a, a very fun, likable character. Um, you know, we, we got to a little bit more depth to her, a little bit more insight to her personality, who she is through this whole play, you know, that's kind of developed throughout the season. Um, but it just... Uh, and no matter how crazy Euphoria has ever gotten, no matter how over the top or, uh, you know, um, it, it always has still maintained some semblance of reality. Like it's always felt somewhat real. Um, you could see in, in in some situation that these things could happen to people, teenagers, high schoolers, whatever. Um, 
but this play, this whole play situation over the last couple of episodes really sends it into like a fantasy, like non-reality <laughs> that is just so beyond, like, it's just not the biggest of those being the, the arts budget at this school. The and, arts and- budget, <laughs> the, the fact that they they apparently gave the green light to just this like sex and like profane, th- like filled five hour long play. Um, the fact that anyone would even, how many people Attend? would really show up to this thing? Let well, alone the thing, the one, of the things, full. one of the things that this play did reveal is that like, we've always, it's always been positioned that like Maddie and Cassie and like this click rules the school and that they yes. are like the popular kids. But like this play was very much like, everybody at this school fucking hates these people. Oh yeah. And like seeing, seeing like all this stuff play out they were like just it was popcorn entertainment for them as they were like watching these trashy kids that that think they're so important and the way that like nobody was like concerned when bad things were happening but that they were all just like taking it as a joke and, and making fun of it like that confirmed all of our like speculation previously of like are these people like really running the school or not that this is like a very small sample size of euphoria high school yeah and and really the last thing i like really say about it uh, is this show these last couple episodes in particular it's gone so far off the deep end it the writing is so bad like it's just empty platitude after empty platitude just faux deep like monologues by zendaya and lexi and whoever else is, is i swear giving. we heard we heard uh rue's funeral speech for like a combined like three hours <laughs> runtime like that was the <laughs> longest speech in human history oh god and it's just like they're doing their best to make it sound good but it just is not and it's just so poorly edited and directed like why the hell we're in the middle of this big ass shootout this climactic shootout and then we cut away to nate and his dad for 10 minutes and then go back like it just is so like I get cross cutting, I get build, building up tension, but there is just absolutely no reason. And that's just one small example. Ultimately, this show has gone from something I thought could be truly great, truly dramatic, have some sort of depth, have some sort of you know stronger meaning, stronger themes, to a show that is that thinks it's on that level, but is actually almost like it's so lacking self awareness. It feels like it's like Riverdale esque drama and like soap opera over the top fantasy theatrics while masquerading like it is like the peak of like tv drama and it is such an awkward cringeworthy combination uh i really like if there was never another episode of this show ever released i really don't think i would care at this point to be totally honest with you i think these characters are so I think this this season did so much damage to so many of these characters and, and was so disappointing that, I mean, it's hard to think of more disappointing seasons of TV for me. I mean, I don't watch as much TV as you, so I'm sure you could come up with some, but this is this, this is Game of Thrones season eight level, like disappointment, let down expectations versus reality, uh, a real failure, I think. I have a few, like... I know we want to get to the Batman, so I, we could keep talking about Euphoria for an hour, but oh sure. But I have a few more nit, not nitpicks, a few more issues, and then I do want to like I still enjoyed this this season, like obviously not to the extent of the first season, but a few highlights that I do want to call out. So it's not just all negative. Um, but first, the bad. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like this whole show, like the whole premise of the first season was like, yes, the other characters were, were involved, but like the Rue and Jules storyline and like poor Jules, Hunter Schaefer had like, oh. was essentially not even in the last like two or three episodes, yeah. um, which Completely was shafted. De- yeah, devastating. Not to mention like, I, we're not nearly as connected to, to Elliot, to Dominic Fike, but oh. after, after episode five, he was barely even in it, you know, after ratting Rue out and then, yeah um we do get him and it's for a freaking halftime show musical number (laughs) and and it was so long Uh, I saw one tweet that was just like a video of someone 
it was them recording watching on their ipad and they were just tapping the skip 10 seconds button every like over and yeah. over and over until the, the song was done um yeah. but they're just like questionable like character prior prioritization there when you're creating this show um and i i mean poor barbie who plays cat her character was just completely erased from the season i know there's all sorts of like rumors speculation what have you about like her falling out with sam levinson on set and everything but like she had maybe a combined like 10 lines all season um so yeah. tough tough break for her it seems very much like a childish production where if you make the head man upset or, or cross him then yeah r.i.p you're you're rolling euphoria um, yeah it's um he, go ahead as far as far as i like i was just saying if we never got another episode i'd be fine with it i mean even realistically even if i was in love with this and wanted more i mean they're i mean we can't be looking at more than one more season i don't think i mean really yeah I'm, i mean i'm not sure how much further it can even go like because rue is still your your protagonist and like the story revolves around her and so like people there, there were moments this season early on where it was like she was losing the benefit of the doubt and like the character yes. was becoming so self-destructive and unlikable Unlikely. like yeah. that there would be like little room for redemption and then it turned it around and we did get some like semblance of a redemption arc and that she's headed in the right direction which was the complete opposite of how last season ended so hopefully season three is that like the the completion of her arc because yeah. i i couldn't take another okay we we think we're getting better then it relapses again for season three and then we're coming back for season four or something you like and also these kids can't be in high school forever so i know yeah. <laughs> alexa Denny's 31 playing maddie but yeah it's it, it's there's only so much more time but i did want to shout out the 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 good stuff that i liked from the season like as you kind of noted earlier as ridiculous as it may be and as poor as some of the writing may be the performances are all still like very much there like yeah. everyone's doing the best with what they had i i mean the i i was not a fan of how psycho Cassie went and her storyline but Sydney Sweeney was giving it 110 percent all the time so major props there I did love Maddie like Maddie became like my favorite character this season because I feel like a lot of the the story was positioned to kind of like I, I'm trying to think of the, like to justify her mm -hmm. and like prove like all of the horrible shit that she had to go through with Nate um so i really liked matt like everything maddie focused this season yeah. um yeah i think Alex, i think alex demi uh certainly stood out as one of the i think from the supporting cast you know outside of zenday who i thought did a still did a really solid job really great job and especially in a couple episodes in particular i thought alex demi was really a standout and i thought showed a lot of not even necessarily growth but a lot of dynam you know I think she was a dynamic character compared to what she was in season one. And there was a lot of growth and kind of depth that was kind of mine from that. And I think Demi, her performance and, and her uh, chops kind of really helped elevate that. I did wish that we got more of the SmackDown though. Oh, uh, for sure. We got one slap and we got a head smashed in the wall. She deserved to get just fucking but, rocked. Dude. Yeah, but I, I wish we could have could have seen more of of maddie just beating cassie but <laughs> i think that's enough euphoria talk we'll see if we season three is supposedly in 2024 so who knows if that will actually come to fruition if there's going to be more bad blood between the cast and the crew and and the production yeah. if, if it'll actually end up happening or or what the the case may be at that time but until then we have season two of euphoria in the books and let's turn our attention to the movie front because it is time i did my homework i watched batman begins i watched the dark knight i watched the dark knight rises i didn't do all of the homework that you did with the the other previous the keaton batman movies and, and such mm. beforehand but i i felt very much prepared for matt reeves 
reboot of the Caped Crusader with the Batman here. And and I know we said it off the top, but this thing, this thing more than delivered Johnny, didn't it? <laughs> oh, Zach, this movie was absolutely phenomenal. I cannot believe just, and I tweeted this last night and I, I said this to you on the phone, I think, but I followed this movie as closely and for as long as basically anyone could. I'm sure there are others out there who are maniacs like me, but I mean, I remember where I was at when the, you know, when we got the news that Ben Affleck was dropping out, that he wasn't going to direct. And then there was hints that he was still going to star in it, but they were going to look for someone else. I remember that night they hinted at who could, who could be the options. And Matt Reeves was one of the names. I was like, Oh my God, that would just be a dream come true. I think he'd be excellent. Then they actually got him. And then there's, you know, who's going to play Batman because now Ben Affleck's not even going to be Batman anymore. And then they got Pattinson. Um, And it's just been a whirlwind after casting announcement, after announcement, uh, shooting on set photos, reveals, everything. And watching the the Batman stunt man wipe out on the motorcycle. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And there's just been, it's just been such, I can't even imagine, I could not imagine being a part of the production and the cast and crew and, and let alone Matt Reeves, like seeing it from beginning to end, but um, just what a fantastic journey it's been. And I had just such high expectations um, for this movie and it really somehow managed to surpass them. I was very, like as closely as I followed, I was still very surprised. I was still on the edge of my seat. I was still blown away by the the different plot elements that they brought into this, the way it was all connected, um, and just the twists and and the Riddler and and the humor in this movie and the visuals. I mean, there's so many. I mean, you think you've seen? There's been what three trailers and and there's been a bunch of clips released behind the scenes stuff. You think you've seen something? You think you've been spoiled? I really don't think so. I think there's so many uh, fantastic visual elements to this movie. I think there's so many great little plot points and, and tidbits. And nothing compares specifically to the atmosphere you get when you're watching a three-hour movie mm-hmm. that is just so epic and so drenched in uh, the sound design and the, the, ac- the actual visuals that just really dominate the mood of the film. Um, nothing compares. And I cannot wait. I saw it in, in an IMAX uh, last night, of course, with the, the fan premiere, and then you did as well. But I'm going to be back in an even bigger IMAX tomorrow, um, and I, I just really can't wait to get in there with, like, 400 people, see it on this massive screen with that sound, shaking the chairs again, um, and just getting everyone's reactions. It's going to be great. Yeah, I mean, oh, my goodness. What <laughs> – I obviously was not to the extent that you were, like – tracking this movie from day one i was super excited for it um and obviously was doing the homework rewatching stuff getting ready for the next take on the batman wanted to be able to compare it to what we had previously had um but still went into this with extremely high expectations because of reeves because of expectations for what robert pattinson would do with the character because of what we had seen so far and like you said it it exceeded those expectations mm. and I was not, I don't know how, how informed you were. I know like as far as the plot specifics or like if you had read anything like, uh, yeah. or, or, if you, or if you were going in just like completely not blind, but like un- unaware of like what the plot was going to be. Like I knew like just what the trailer told me. I hadn't like read anything additional because I wanted to kind of just be able to experience it all for the first time. So like, I knew that the Riddler was the bad guy. I knew that there was the penguin in there, that there was Falcone in there, but I did not like know much more than, than what we saw in the trailer. So to go in at that level of knowledge, like I was completely blown away with the, the story that was told. We had heard all of those previous um, references saying that, Oh, it's, it's like a, part murder mystery crime thriller like a zodiac or a seven Mm -hmm. um it's like a noir movie um from the 70s and and like our our buddy josh who's been on the podcast before he he always gives kind of like an eye roll to those kind of comparisons (laughs) because a lot of the times you hear like yeah the captain america and the winter soldier is like this grungy 80s spy thriller i don't know if that's the correct description that they they gave there but like a lot of times the marvel movies are just like this big 
um, blockbuster will throw out some like prestige movie. Like yeah. the Joker is taxi driver. I remember that was a big one. Yeah. Um, and that like Josh, who's like the, the film expert of our group is oh, yeah. just like, Oh my goodness. Stop. Don't do that. It'll just make me. Hate <laughs> me. But Josh, I have to say that those, those comparisons, at least to Zodiac to seven, the, the noir parallels, like it, it was spot on because this is not a superhero movie in the sense that we know of today. This is not like when you hear superhero movie, there's like a certain connotation around it that it's going to be like this big explosive CGI filled movie. And like, I love those movies. Like we, a couple of weeks ago, we're talking about how fantastic Spider-Man No Way Home was and that it was like, uh, we're applauding in the theater, but this is not that this is very much a comic book movie but it's not a quote unquote superhero movie that you think of today like it's the the true version of gotham city of batman the detective of everything that you've seen on those pages brought to life in a way that is so fleshed out so lived in and realized on screen like it hasn't been like that before with i just went through the dark knight trilogy um you know like that's that's new york gotham is new york city there and like it feels exactly like new york city you're just calling it gotham but here it's very much its own like i know they shot some in chicago and um and there i don't even you you know all that other stuff but like yeah it, this didn't feel like it was oh, they're just calling New York Gotham. This was like, this is, where am I? This is Gotham. Um, yeah. And so yeah, 100%. That, that's, what, that's what I mean by like, it's comic booky as in it's like accurate to that, but it isn't superhero, hero-y. Um, so just making up words over here on the podcast, but <laughs> it was, it was everything I could have hoped for and more. I know this is like supposed to be our like opening remarks. And I feel like I've gone through like, all of my emotions already i'm sure there's more to come um but it's i as someone who loves those movies who loves seven and and zodiac and like my favorite genre is like the serial killer murder mystery type you know prisoners Mm -hmm. or um silence of the lambs anything like that like this felt like one of those movies that i tweeted just so happens to have batman in it and take place in gotham city you know it's Mm. it's that first and foremost and then like yeah there's batman there's action there's there's fight scenes and stuff and those are fantastic when they are in there but like the the mystery the the detective story really takes a front seat here like nothing that we've seen from a a batman movie in in past iterations yeah uh, there's so much to break down um so let's start i mean have we even gotten into like the basic details of this movie? Like, we have, have we not. Talked? We have not delivered the starring, <laughs> the, the rotten tomatoes, um, anything. So right now we can say, of course, everyone knows it's starring Mr. Battenson himself, Robert Pattinson, as Bruce Wayne, as Batman. And God, is he Batman for a lot of this movie. And it is absolutely glorious to see. Um, Zoe Kravitz as Selena Kyle and uh, you know, slash Catwoman. Jeffrey Wright as Jim Gordon. Colin Farrell as Penguin. Paul Dano as the Riddler, John Turturro as Carmine Falcone, and Andy Serkis as Alfred. Um, they all bring, I mean, these characters, we've seen these characters before. We've seen them played by other actors, other films, other uh, times in history. There's a lot to uh, dig into there. But um, right now, as things stand, it's still early. We know, of course, critics, all that stuff dropped on Monday, uh, scores, reactions, reviews. Um, audiences just started to get to see it last night, so we haven't gotten any audience score in, but the 86% for critics as it stands right now, I think there's like 220 something reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Very solid, very, um, it's, and then for the average score, I think it's like 7.8, 7.9, which is pretty pretty uh, high up there for especially comic book movies. Um, now, our scores, you know, we were talking about this last night. I mean, we were just floored by this. I mean, I was walking in expecting like an amazing movie, um, but I really think just all these different facets and nuances that we're going to get into really elevated this um, for me where it's it's really, yeah, it's in that 90 to like 95 out of 100 type range. Um, Zach, what would you score this? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely five stars for me. 
Like yeah. on, on the five star rating, this is five stars. I need to <laughs> see it again to like clarify just to make sure, you know, have I've seen some of those critics who did get to see it early and then attend the fan event. You know, yeah. people have already been talking about like you pick up more on the second time. Like that and like you do with the, these murder mystery movies. So I would expect nothing less from this. Um, mm. So I, I want to see how that second viewing whether I, I appreciate it more or if I find nitpicks or anything, which I doubt, but I do need to see that. Um, and I, so I especially need to see that before I, people have asked me at work today, is this better than the dark Knight? And like, we can get into that discussion in a bit, but I need sure, to see yeah. it again before I, before I oh, can, yeah. can I mean, justify, make a statement there. <laughs> they're, they're so different. Um, yeah. And it's hard to compare, but yeah. yeah. I, I know I, I, I came clean to you last night at the risk of our friendship. I, I didn't know how you would react. And <laughs> the statement was that I may have liked this more than Dune, which was another five star for me. Yeah. So luckily we are here today recording this podcast. Uh, Johnny did not have a hit orchestrated on me uh, for well, that statement. I mean, but, what did I, I mean, what, what I said though, when you said that your, was, your response was that you could be in the same boat. I didn't want to out you if, if that was <laughs> confidential information. No, but like, I mean, I definitely thought during the movie multiple times, I was like, I mean, cause it just kept getting better and it kept shocking me. And I was like, this is just so, I mean, I, it was just shock is like the best way to describe it. Cause it was so many elements. And again, when I followed it this closely for so long, I really thought I had it all kind of figured out. I kind of, as the movie went along, I thought I was piecing certain things together, kind of getting ahead of the game. Um, and I, and, and I wasn't really, I mean, I think Matt Reeves did such a good job writing this, directing it. Um, and in the marketing, I think they did such a good job of kind of misleading uh, viewers or potentially hiding things that it, it, it really, I was like, wow, I have not been this truly like very, because with Dune, you know, I, I knew what I was getting with Dune. I've read the book. Everyone, it's a very famous right. book. Right. It's an adaptation. Dune, Batman, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amalgamation of other very famous comic books, graphic novels, et cetera, but it's still its own original thing. It's still something that is, you're, you're really, it's keeping you on the edge of your seat. You're not really sure what to expect at any given moment. And I think that was so powerful and really struck me. I was like, I, and I tweeted this just earlier today. I said, I think this, since Blade Runner 2049 came out like four and a half years ago, I think this is the most like shook in my chair in the theater and afterwards, like the day afterwards that I have been seeing, not, not even just a big budget movie, but maybe any movie, just because I had so much focus on this movie and I was so uh, engaged with it. Um, yeah, I can see. I was thinking to myself, like, wow, I this is like even this is on Dune levels, if not, uh, you know, superior. Um, well, and there, of course, that, like, that whole comparison. I mean, there's that's a whole other like can of worms, but um, I, I feel like it's not fair to compare that to Dune until we get Dune part two to then agreed. see yeah. the, the full because this is a full complete, it's the, the start of a trilogy, but this is its own like self contained first chapter. like start and finish of, of a movie here um yeah but with all that being said i gave dune a 96 out of 100 tentative 97 out of 100 here <laughs> until until further notice until so hey that's fair high um, high marks for me yeah i mean and what we're gonna get into here i mean the plot and we're talking about the plot we're talking about how it kind of shook me shook me from beginning to end um for everyone who is not aware at this point, I'm sure most of you are, the little, little blurb we have is Batman ventures into Gotham City's underworld when a sadistic killer leaves behind a trail of cryptic clues. As the evidence begins to lead closer to home and the scale of the perpetrator's plans become clear, he must forge new relationships, unmask the culprit, and bring justice to the abuse of power and corruption that has long plagued the metropolis. So that gives you just a, like a little glimpse of like the scope of the, the story, the scope of the, the movie. Um, Gotham City, one of the main points we'll just like I want to touch on right at the top because I think it's such a strong um, element. And that's something that I alluded to earlier with this referencing the sound and the visuals and the atmosphere. I mean, uh, Gotham is a true character in this movie, unlike any of the other films, I think. I think even compared to the Tim Burton um 
films, which are very art deco, they're very gothic, very over the top sets and, and props and, and just the design. It's like an out of time kind of element to it. Um, it's not really period accurate to anything. It's not really set in any era. Um, this is not like that. I mean, this is still, it's, it's so, so amazing to me how Matt Reeves has struck this balance between people say and talk so much about how the Nolan films are so realistic, so grounded, so gritty, so dark. This is darker than those Nolan movies. This is grittier, grimier than those Nolan movies. And somehow it's the, the balance that I'm talking about. It's more re realistic and more believable than those Nolan movies. Yet still, it feels like more elevated and more not of this world necessarily, but still etched into like the United States or, or the world at large, as far as Gotham and the politics and the characters. It's, it's just, but it's just so different because watching the Nolan movies and you just watched a couple of them, at least, you know, it's Chicago, right? Like it's basically Chicago, like straight out. And then the Dark Knight Rises, it's basically an amalgamation of Pittsburgh, Chicago, LA, New York. It, it looks, it doesn't ever really fool you into thinking, oh, this is its own universe. This is its own thing. You're just kind of seeing familiar landmarks and these different items that are just being kind of mashed together. Heinz Field, um, the Triborough Bridge, uh, all these other elements. Whereas in this, it, it's not any city that, that you can think of. It, it looks, has feelings or elements that might be similar to places like Chicago or New York. And they did or like a Times Square type. Yeah, I mean, there's either, there, it's Garden Square. Um, what, what is it? Gotham Square. It's Gotham Garden. Square Garden. Yeah, is the arena that they're in um, in this movie. Um, so obviously, a reference to Madison Square Garden. Um, like there are those elements that grounded in reality, but it looks unlike anything really. Like it has a. And one uh, thing, one thing ahead. that, one thing that goes like takes this even a step further, is like it's sort of has this like ambiguous time period as well like yeah it, it's it, there's like modern technology and like there's a usb drive and like phone like cell phones and stuff and all like social media but then at the same time like some of i, I mean the, the batmobile is like an old school muscle car and yeah. it i i think that's just partially yeah. like the, the total like noir aspect element of it that gives yeah. it this this like 70s feel to it mm. um but i feel like that was also just like this whole other element that was coming into play when it was just creating like you said that sort of like all consuming atmosphere that really just puts you into this movie yeah absolutely that's those are good points because it does i remember originally the rumor i think when this movie was getting into development was a lot of people said it might be like set in the 90s potentially or like um, just a, it's not a prequel, but it's just set in or later in in our in our history um, or earlier rather, and it's not, but it's it, it's it feels very modern. There's social media, there's certain technologies, there's futuristic technology, um, that is not really. It's like it's on the cusp of of reality. It feels like um, it never really goes over the edge into something that you couldn't believe might exist secretly somewhere in some military base or is right around the corner. Um, and so I, I really liked that because even in the dark night, like no one goes to such lengths to make these things believable or Batman begins with the tumbler and with the Cape and the way it, like you run a current through it and, it and it turns into this, you know, thing that you can use to fly. Um, and the, the armor and all these other items, it's, it is believable, but it's more fantastical than anything I think we get in this movie. I mean, in, in reality. Um, and I think, yeah, talking about the aesthetic and these callbacks to other films, it does have this grimy, I mean, Joker had it as well to a degree. I think the atmosphere of this movie, I mean, it's even better than Joker. I think, I think the production design, I think the, the sound design and the, the cinematography is just unbelievable. Um, that it's just unbelievable, Greg Frazier, the role he is on right now. Um, it's gorgeous, 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 and ugly, ugly in a lot of ways, but it's ugly to the point of beauty a lot of the time. Um, and 
uh, there's that, and then the costumes and and all these the characters that come and come to life in this thing. Um, and I think that's where we can kind of talk uh, about the the performances and and the, the different roles we have here because there's it is a full on it is like an ensemble essentially. I mean, Robert Pattinson is the true lead. I mean, he is carrying it on his shoulders 100. percent but there's a lot of characters in the mix and they all make a huge impact, I think, on the film and have a very strong presence when they are on screen or even when they're off screen. Yeah, because I mean, like this is advertised as like the Riddler movie, you know, like he's he's the villain. But yeah. then you're you also come into this knowing that the Penguin, an iconic Batman villain, that he's in this and he's played by a, a major actor. So it's not like he's just going to be some afterthought that Carmine Falcone the biggest like mob boss in the history of Gotham is is here as well and that that's another star actor like that these are going to be not like tertiary or background characters but instead they're going to be active in the plot as well um and that there's even another big villain in there that that there was speculation on and that did appear um so and that's just on the bad guy's side you know you've got the it it almost is this like buddy cop comedy not comedy but buddy cop like investigation because yeah. you've got batman and and jim gordon uh jeffrey wright is fantastic in this oh, yeah. uh this version of i guess he starts off as detective gordon and then and then gets does he get it i can't remember uh, if he, i think he's, he's like lieutenant gordon in this Okay. I don't think he Lieutenant, necessarily gets promoted at any point, but because the commissioner is, the commissioner is killed, so it, it opens the pathway for him to yeah. get a promotion. Um, but like it is kind of that they're playing off of each other. It's not like you know, like ride around in the car together, buddy comedy, but like they're working hand in hand to solve this mystery. Batman is or Gordon is the only one who who trusts and believes in Batman and. and it's the same way for for batman like he is not welcome except with commissioner gordon um or it's hard not to call him commissioner gordon after just <laughs> watching the the nolan movies but um and then like you said selena kyle um she's kind of thrown into that too as a partner um more so than what we got with anne hathaway and christian bale that was kind of like a yeah and, and like an anti-hero and it, it's clear that like Catwoman here is like has good values and like I found her to be to, very likable yeah agreed like the Anne Hathaway one is very like standoffish and like yeah. still like very self-serving and like while yes. yeah. Zoe Kravitz's character still has some of that like just trying to to get a score yeah but but it it was very palpable the the like genuine connection she had with Batman and and yeah. it helps when the the actors have fantastic chemistry as well um but like she she was a huge player in this and, and a lot of the plot revolves around like as the mystery unfolds she's a huge part of it her family is a huge part of it um and and then alfred of course andy circus is in there in this newer much different version of alfred than we had gotten previously with uh with michael kane uh, a lot more fit oh, and active yeah. version um but and that's a whole different dynamic between Batman and and Alfred between Bruce and Alfred. Um, so yeah, I mean that ensemble comment you made is is spot on. That Bruce is the lead, but there are so many equal parts here um, beyond just Bruce. Yeah, it's and the most amazing thing about this. Okay, so are, are we? It's not we're going to spoilers then. It's it seems like. Yeah, I mean this this is gonna. The, the movie will be out by the time you're listening to this. So um, if not, this is your spoiler warning. Pause here. Come back after the movie ends. <laughs> um, so, um, and I'm not going to hop in anything in particular with spoilers, but I think Pattinson, he's fucking unreal in this movie. I think he is just, I mean, this is one of the best performances in any superhero movie. I think, I think it's really up there with, it, it's so different from a lot of what we see in these movies usually um because a lot of the performances when we talk about them they're very much like showy and that i'm not even using that in like a derogatory sense but 
um, like I'm thinking about like Hugh Jackman and Logan, like there's a lot of emotion for him in that movie. Like he's crying and it's very, he's yelling a lot. And, and then there's a lot of anger and like, uh, you know, uh, emotion like right on the surface in that. Um, and then you also have, you know, Robert Downey Jr. playing as smart ass, like very funny. And then, you know, he can get into some more darker, like emotional spaces, like an end game. Um, but I feel like this was such a nuanced, very careful line to walk performance where he he couldn't be too emotional, but he couldn't be too stoic or too um, like impenetrable. Like he allowed just enough, I think, in for the viewer to understand. I mean, this guy is like tremendously damaged. He's like stunted. He is um scared he, he, there's just so many different feelings that you can read on his face and it's it varies scene to scene um there are certain scenes that are far more definitely really go for the heart strings a little bit more than others there's a really great uh moment that we talked about last night on the phone where um spoiler alert alfred almost gets killed by the riddler he sends a package to Bruce Wayne um, and Alfred is there to receive it while Bruce is out as Batman. And uh, it, he, he's able to escape with his life and he's in the hospital. And then Bruce goes to visit and he's sitting with him later on in the movie. And they have this heart to heart where he basically confronts him um, about, you know, his past, his parents, because spoiler alert, there's some really seedy shit potentially going on with his parents. And that's the great thing too, is like, you could say, oh, there are bad people. There's some really seedy stuff going on with them. Like they're just, they're not who they said to be. And and yeah, some of that might be true, but this movie does such a great job making it so gray and so not black and white about what is what is good actually. What is a good person? What is a good man? Uh, Carmine Falcone says you'd be, you know, you'd be surprised or amazed by what a good man will do like in the right situation. Um, and he's even talking about Thomas Wayne in particular in that moment. And it does seem like, oh, you, you would hate this guy. Or you'd want to see him go down, you know, referring to Bruce Wayne's father. And, and ultimately it's like, well, you know, he, maybe he really just got into the wrong situation. He was trying to do something wrong, but for the right reasons and vice versa. Um, and there's this moment where they're having this heart to heart about his family, about his you know trauma and what he's been through and him and Alfred and their relationship. And it just, it, oh, it, it really, it was really getting me in my feels. I was like very much, I mean, Robert Pattinson, I was just really shook by how good he was. And I knew he'd be great. I had no doubt about it. But I think for, for me, he is a very different Bruce Wayne compared to what you'll see in the usual. I mean, the Dark Knight, uh, Christian Bale is definitely playing up like that playboy kind of hot shot right. public persona. Whereas in this, what I think is going to be amazing about this trilogy, presumably we're going to get a trilogy out of this, is he is so damaged and so stunted and so uh, broken down in this movie. I think getting to see him evolve into that Bruce Wayne or not even into that Bruce Wayne, like in a legitimate sense, but knowing he has to put on a show, he has to come up with a persona to help balance himself out, to help maybe uh, open other doors that potentially won't be there if he's going around as he is in this movie. Um, and I think that'll be really interesting because that in this, you know, portion of it there is no glimpse of really that bruce wayne where he's going out with models and going to galas and all these other things it's it's he's a hermit just, and, and so he, just, he is a hermit he's a true hermit and he is um he's got the long droopy hair and, and he's just looks so fucking tired all the time and beaten up and uh i think it, it'll be really interesting and can be really uh, a lot can be done with this character in the arc that we could see him go through in the next couple of movies. And uh, I just think this is such a solid starting point. And for me, the emotional depth, the amount of time he's on screen, the amount of time we get to see him as Batman. I just think that he, for me, he checks all the boxes. I like Michael Keaton. I really liked Christian Bale. I, I even like Ben Affleck more than most people. I can't really speak on Val Kilmer or George Clooney because I haven't seen those movies in so long. But for me, I think this has all the right elements. It's a unique take, but still feels like it's coming from a place that's true in the comics or there's like a respect there, canon uh, established. I really think this is this is the ultimate 
Bruce Wayne and it will be the ultimate Bruce Wayne by the time everything is said and done. But I think this is the beginnings of that, uh, at least for me. And to think about how many, how many people doubted that casting news when Robert Pattinson was first announced and people mm-hmm. like, there's still like, I was having this discussion at work today when someone asked me like, if it was better than dark Knight, And, and I was like, this is the best, like, portrayal of batman that there has ever been on screen of, of bruce wayne and Agreed. yeah and um i i like kind of that deflected shouldn't be the, controversial the, i deflected all. the dark knight question and answered the the batman as a character <laughs> question um yeah and the one of the responses was like oh well i just can't get behind edward from twilight i i don't know oh. how i feel about that and i'm like first of all like i i pulled up a picture of Robert Pattinson's letterbox profile with all of his roles outside of the Twilight movies. And I was like, this is plenty of resume right here. But yeah. if that wasn't sold, like still just go and see this and then you will finally understand what I am talking about here. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think there's no way anyone, no matter how skeptical, I'll be curious because my mom is kind of similar in that regard. She thinks the movie looks really good, but Robert Pattinson, uh, I think I'll be curious to see what she says, but I think it, I'd be amazed if anyone could watch this movie and come away thinking, yeah, Robert Pattinson wasn't very good in that. I didn't believe him. I didn't think he was a good Batman. I didn't think he was a good Bruce Wayne. I think he is like undeniable in this movie and in this role. Um, and honestly, I think the same, we've been talking about how good this movie is, of course, from talking about how great the cast is. I think virtually, again, it's very early. We literally just saw it. it's only one movie versus some of these other characters or iterations that have two or three movies. I mean, I very, I feel very confident and strongly that these could be the best iterations of all these characters when everything is said and done. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's just so much depth to, to Zoe Kravitz as Selena Kyle. I think uh, she's not, she's not just, a, she's not a damsel in distress. That's for damn sure. Um, and she is not someone where uh, she doesn't have real goals or like aspirations or desire she's not acting for herself or like uh, keeping uh, other people's um you know whether it's bruce or someone else keeping their um objectives like above her own like she is definitely self-serving but she is willing to work with bruce she's willing to forge like relationships and she is she's just really likable like i think that's the best way and she seems relatively normal as well like compared to like the michelle fight for selena kyle for example like that that selena kyle was not really relatable like she's definitely over the top whereas this is a little bit more grounded or like natural um and i think really i mean jeffrey wright i thought was just fan fucking tastic as as oh yeah Gordon. i thought he had so many great one-liners so many great not even just one-liners that were like funny necessarily and a lot of them are funny but just like clever little moments or like comments or just his line delivery would just feel so rich. And like, he is a very, he is, he's a detective just like Batman. And he's like got that hard boiled side feel vibe to him. Um, And he's, he's out there risking his life to do the right thing. And he's putting his ass on the line. It does harken back to that seventies, like crime noir mystery, uh, you know, genre or those films where these guys are there, they're just normal guys, but they're going out and kind of trying to do these like almost extraordinary things to, to get to the bottom of the case or to like bring justice uh, to a, a city. Um, and, and Colin, Colin Farrell, man. I mean, are we, are we joking with how good this guy is in this movie? Like uh, he's so unrecognizable. I mean, we were the, talking about, it was oh. the perfect like balance of like not coming across like comical uh, yes. as the penguin but like that he he was like very believable as this like nice mo- like honestly like a nice mobster like nice until you cross me kind of thing because like yeah. he seemed he seemed like genuine when he was like greeting bruce at the funeral and was like yeah yeah oh my like oh my god this is bruce wayne like what a guy and then like yeah <laughs> well, and even then, like even, first... even talking to batman like yeah. the, before he like gets himself in trouble and then like yeah. turns savage and like into yeah. <laughs> what we anticipate like a actual like villainous penguin will be like but it was yeah. it, it was such like a, a unique twist on it versus like I, my, my biggest I I haven't seen the the Keaton Batman movie so I haven't seen like the Danny DeVito 
penguin. Um, so I, I would say like my biggest um, reference point for like an on-screen penguin is in the TV show Gotham, um, oh, okay. which was like very much like the, that version was like this guy who was so overlooked and like constantly like belittled and stuff. And that did, this version didn't have any sort of that, which I think worked really well. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's definitely again. I haven't really seen Gotham. My best reference point would be the Danny DeVito, creepy, animalistic, not really comic accurate whatsoever, Penguin. And he that that's an interesting take, no doubt. I think DeVito is fantastic. Um, but this is just it's perfect. It's straight out of the comics. And you're right. He doesn't. There there is nuance to him. There is a depth to him it could have just been played straight for laughs or straight for like comedic relief in what is a very dark movie. But while he, I mean, don't get me wrong. He's fucking hilarious. A lot of the time, actually. Um, and it's not even like he's, he's, he's not even necessarily trying to be funny, but it's just like the, the lines that they give him and the way he delivers them and his, his, his voice and, and his uh, mannerisms, it, it just, it really works. But there is, yeah, I, I was very blown away in that first scene where he is with Batman and they're having like a legit, like, I wouldn't call it like a heart to heart, but they're having like, it seems like what is a genuine conversation um, where there's not like necessarily like a judgment going on between the two. There's like an actual like interaction where they're trying to maybe exchange some information or, or what have you. And then of course, yeah, he does kind of turn, he goes um, full, you know, he, he, he cobble pot at the end where he's kind of now transitioning into this potential kingpin figure um and willing to do what it takes to to get that and get what he wants um and while we're talking while we're talking kingpins uh carmine falcone played by john Turturro, a much bigger presence than i anticipated especially mm -hmm. with regards to like how he factors into the plot um there is one plot twist in particular where i, I mean i gasped out loud i think a lot of the, i heard multiple people around me gasp where it's revealed that, uh, spoiler alert, John Turturro as Carmine Falcone, Falcone is actually Selena Kyle's dad in this version. Um, and her, her mother died uh, and was killed. This happened way in the past, of course, but she was working at the same club that he currently operates where she now works. Um, and so- and It was kind uh, of ambiguous too, at least for me, I was not a hundred percent sure if he knew or not like, because right. they, because yeah. they like, they like mentioned that she was in the club all the time as a child. And yeah. then they don't specify like whether she just like continuously did like stayed there or if she like after her mother's death left and then came back grown up. And like, now yeah. he doesn't recognize her or anything until it is later revealed that he did not realize it was her. Cause like, when that information is initially presented like we've seen them have like a somewhat friendly interaction and we don't yeah. know if this is just like falcone like being kind of like a schmuck like schmoozing with like one of his creep. yeah a <laughs> creep yeah trying to like schmooze with one of these like attractive women in his club yeah or if it was like because he has a soft spot for her because he's he knows that that's his daughter but then obviously the big reveal is that he did not know because she springs that on him in the the last act yeah it's it's nutty i mean i was really like blown away and again that's what i'm talking about i never saw that coming i, I mean maybe maybe rewatching it the clues will be there or it'll seem a little bit more obvious but that's not something i saw like in any leaks and i didn't get it spoiled anywhere so i was very pleased i was like wow i did not you know have a, even an inkling of that and, and then additionally um, speaking of his actual performance in the character, I thought he was just, I mean, he was, he was channeling like peak, you know, crime boss, like mobster movie, like Scorsese type, Cop Cop Coppola type, um, you know, big bad guys like kingpins. And I thought that really, I thought he was just brilliant. Um, and there's that joke, that tweet where someone, when he was first cast, someone was like, I was like, oh my God, Al fucking Pacino. Um, and hey, maybe they do look a little similar. They're both a little bit older. Um, maybe they even sound a little similar. But uh, I think I think John Turturro, I mean, Al Pacino is an all-time great actor, of course. But I think John Turturro 
absolutely delivered, crashed it out of the park. I don't even know if Al Pacino would have done even nearly as, as quite as good, um, you know, given this type of movie. I think John Turturro was just right up for the task to kind of dive into this world and and take it for for what Matt Reeves was going for. Um, and then, really, finally, as far as performances go, we cannot gla- you know just glance over uh, Paul Dano as the Riddler or Edward Nashton. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot going on here, and honestly, I mean, the Riddler is a jaw dropping character. Um, I think from the first scene to the, to basically the end, he is like it was genuinely like shocking um, in his performance, his appearance. Um, man, I mean, okay, let's talk about the very first shot of the movie that where you see him for the first time. Yeah, you know yes. what I'm talking. Oh my about. god, yes. <laughs> the- like straight off the bat like this the, it, the movie starts like from his perspective um oh, or it's so like, good but but like when you actually see him for the first time it's like okay th- this is gonna be he's a creepy <laughs> dude this is a horror movie shot like you would not believe i couldn't believe what i was seeing when this was going on um it was so brilliant and he is just so brutal and and calculating and almost conscious like consciousless like he, he has no uh inner he, he, like balance whatsoever and the other moment that really like uh, my jaw was on the floor was well there's two elements towards the end when he's finally captured there's the scene where he's face to face with batman and they're in arkham and it is uh I mean, he's just basically, he's going just absolutely ape shit. <laughs> like he is uh, unhinged, like to the max. And it's uh, like, what, what does he say over and over again? Or he's like, oh, he's like, um, uh, it's like, this is not how it was supposed to go or something like that. But the way he says it, like, it's very like elongated and like drawn out um and like very dramatic and it's just like i couldn't believe that he was really going to that level of i mean paul dano he's a fucking fantastic actor as everyone knows but i genuinely think this is one of his best performances i think he does a lot of interesting things like you can there are elements that you kind of like sympathize with you understand like you feel bad that he was in these certain positions or that he you can understand his perspective but ultimately he just does so much bad shit and does so much messed up stuff to to his victims and to the city at large um and then there's there's also this other moment where he's basically he has social media and he's kind of running it's like this this like underworld social media underworld like dark web like where he's built up this incel type shit yeah 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 incel is like the best way to describe it but like (laughs) he like it's I feel like that stuff in movies can like it can go one of two ways and either be like you know way overblown and like feel out of place like it it this was like the perfect amount of of like creepiness because they had developed the character so well and it wasn't like sprung on you from the bat but instead that like this was like the final step in his plan. And so you had kind of like got this feel for him and then it all made sense that like, yes, this is like exactly something that the Riddler would do um, where he's like gotten his followers and built them up and then ha- has them like carry out the remainder of his plan. But it, it I, I, I feel like that has the potential to go the wrong way in a movie, but here it absolutely did not. Yeah, that, that's a great point because I, I certainly feel similarly um, with regards to what you just said, how it can go wrong, but also how I felt like it went like very much right. Um, it, it, that's why my jaw was on the floor because first off, I couldn't believe because it, it comes on very late in the game where maybe the clues are there where you can you can see that, okay, he's kind of maybe assembling like some sort of like almost like an army, right? And he's leading these people into this situation where, I mean, they're, they're taking it upon themselves to just uh, arm themselves and go out and just do uh, violence, mass, you know, killings potentially. Um, and it's just so shockingly uh, like, it feels very real. Like I'm almost, I'm amazed because 
Joker got so much pushback and was like, oh, this is just too, it's too realistic. It's too, uh, yeah. this, is gonna inspire, <laughs> this is gonna inspire people to go out and kill people and, and shoot up whatever. I mean, this is so- This is 10 times worse than that. <laughs> like, this I didn't even think so of that. This is so incendiary yeah. and like explosive, like no, like no pun intended. Um, like it, it's just so crazy that they let Matt Reeves do this. And like- This I is a literal them. serial killer. Like- Yeah, it's a literal serial killer gathering his own little army to go out and shoot up an arena full of people. Like that's- can you imagine like think about what i just said like we have someone who's going to go shoot up an arena an army of people that is going to go shoot up an arena full of people in a batman movie and like it's i my jaw was on the ground i just couldn't believe it and i mean that the best way because i'm I, i am glad that they let matt reeves go that far they let him go that direction Maybe it's not going to work for everyone. Maybe it's going to be a little too unsettling, a little too upsetting. I mean, we're talking about a world where uh, the last solo Batman movie that came out, there was, in in the United States, there was literally a mass shooting at one of these movies. And it's one of, it's a horrible, like one of the worst tragedies in in US history, as far as like mass shootings goes. And so just the fact like that they still were like, fuck it. Like, we know this is something that happens. We know that this is something for dramatic purposes can work for the story like let's just fucking push it and and roll with it to the edge and that's again those elements those darker realistic gritty disturbing elements this movie felt rated r i know it's pg-13 but it really does feel i mean we talked about seven we talked about zodiac the amount of drugs in this movie there's a great f-bomb by the way it got the f-bomb in there (laughs) they used it early in the movie um and i i was very pleased to see that uh happy fucking halloween um and uh it just the the amount again i've seen people say this is not a kids movie i think family's going to this that people are saying i think family's going to this are, are going to be in for a rude awakening because it's three hours of like dad i want to see the new batman <laughs> <laughs> it's just three hours of like murders and torture and and it ends with a like a mass shooting and the bombs going off like it's just insanity but ultimately what is so beautiful and why this movie is such a fantastic piece of, of Batman uh, mythology is Matt Reeves. Cause at times you can almost feel like, so Zack Snyder did Batman. Right. And it was just a lot of people gave him a lot of flack for a lot of different reasons, but Zack Snyder is known for being super gritty, super dark, super serious. Right. Um, I feel like in this movie, it's almost like Reeves is doing everything that, Snyder maybe wanted to do or like thought he might have been doing and he does it but in a way that like is more palatable or just makes more sense or like feels more like appropriate and in addition he has great humor throughout he has genuine romantic development romantic tension sexual tension um, chemistry on screen and then it concludes with just a beautiful touching emotional conclusion for batman for this character this arc that he goes on through the story where he he evolves from a vigilante like a a, someone who can't be trusted a a demon like in the shadows to someone who is in the light he's literally out in the sunlight carrying victims of this disaster to safety working with police working with firefighters emergency services like He's and he's holding people's hands. He's like guiding them through the darkness into the light and like wielding the torch. And and it just there's there's a mythic quality to it. There's a biblical quality to it. That's another comparison. I mean, Zack Snyder. Everyone knows. Everyone and their mother knows that uh, he loves his biblical references or parallels. He he loves his mythology, his that kind of stuff. This I felt just was so went down so smoothly was so excellent, so well executed. Um, And not only is it a satisfying conclusion, is it a satisfying story in and of itself, but what we can touch on here at the end, if you'd like, is just the way it sets up and and wraps up all these stories while leaving the door open for directions that they could go, um, not only for Bruce, but also Selina, Penguin, Riddler, uh, and some other characters as well. Yeah, I I feel like how you just kind of summed that up is the perfect way because all of that 
horrifying stuff that we just talked about that this movie like explores and touches on like it it does all of that but it didn't ever feel too much or too heavy and i mean like you said some people will take it differently it, it will be too much for some people yeah but like it didn't feel like overbearingly heavy and too dramatic or too dark and twisted you know it, it did like balance everything well and was just like it, it was just the the perfect encapsulation of like everything that we have wanted from this character in this world so yeah i'm, I'm excited to see more of it um and, and looking ahead at where we leave this movie like you said bruce batman he's come into the light he's he's being accepted by the people of gotham by the police by the new mayor um literally taking mm. like taking hands together um mm. to to take a stand and the so that's going to open up a, a lot of possibilities more more acts that not that anyone was ever keeping batman out of anywhere but but <laughs> you know less like operating in the shadows like you said and yeah. more more like domain um and as selena says there's going to be a power struggle with falcone going down that that there will be people trying to replace him just like last time um penguin obviously in a, in a huge position to try and do so uh taking over basically what falcone left and we know that penguin is getting a series on hbo max which is another thing i'm curious to see just how these things play off of each other we're getting a, a gotham pd series we're getting a penguin series um so to see like just how much like whether that takes place in between batman one and two whether it's you know a, a prequel or like an adjacent story uh I, i'm just curious to see like what kind of route that will take um and then whether any of the the movie stuff beyond just like obviously the penguin is going to be in the penguin show but like is batman going to be in that is catwoman or is anybody else going to be tied into that from yeah and and vice versa is someone from the show gonna then be a, a main player in the second batman movie and then we've obviously got the riddler who goes down in this movie but is still alive and well in gotham so there's plenty of possibility for you know or sorry not in gotham in arkham people have escaped plenty of people have gotten out of arkham so <laughs> he is very much still in play um for for more more riddles down the road and his uh new best friend in the cell right next to him is the <laughs> fucking joker yeah what a i know you you yeah. had kind of known this was coming i had some speculation but you had your i don't know what your source was or your informant but a <laughs> long time ago you had said that yeah there were two different like screenings going on and that one included a certain character and one didn't um, and I can only imagine that this was said character. Um, yes. But I don't even know how to say his last name. So I'm going to let you say it. But <laughs> um, So, but. yeah, I honestly am not 100% certain. I'm pretty sure it's it's Barry Keon. Um, I'm not Irish by any stretch of the imagination. It's our boy Druig from Eternals. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, he... I mean, he's a, he's a fantastic actor. If you haven't seen it, go watch The Killing of a Sacred Deer starring Colin Farrell, as a matter of fact. Um, he's fucking scary in that movie. And he is very, he's my, he's like our age um, and on the rise without a doubt. So, and he's in Dunkirk. People will know him from that as well. Um, and he was also in The Green Knight last year in a role that was pretty sadistic, kind of dark and, and kind of Joker-esque as well. Um but yeah, we we get a very small glimpse. There's no direct image of him. It is very, it's through the bars. There's sun like in the face of the, you know, in the camera. Um, so you can just kind of make out some like his mouth, his smile, like maybe some scarring or some some makeup or the coloring of his hair, the way it's up. Um, it does, it, it is, it's scary looking. I, like it is definitely scary looking. You can tell it's Joker, but it it's not any like anything we've really seen before, I don't think. The closest, um, the closest that I felt was yeah, the the Joker from the Arkham games. I I can't remember which one, but at some point yeah. it might be the third one. Um, he almost has like a charred side of his face, like he gets burnt, and so like there, 
I don't know if it was, I doubt he has access to makeup in, in Arkham in prison. Um, so I, I, it was some like skin, skin deformity. We only see like the top third of his face from the profile view, but he certainly had, you know, like an updo style hair, not a, not a Heath Ledger style, like long shaggy hair or anything like that. But um, there, obviously you, you mentioned this when we were speaking last night, but this strategic decision to only show that much of him opens up so many possibilities that if they wanted to change something, if they wanted to go a different route, that uh, there, there's plenty of opportunity to do that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, that's kind of what we were getting at last night. But I think, so this is such a different type of movie compared to something like Spider-Man No Way Home. But um, I, did people react in your theater when he popped up? Like when he was saying, talking about being a clown or that you could kind of see his face or he started laughing? I mean, it wasn't like a Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield reaction. <laughs> um, but certainly like some some murmurs and gasps and stuff. I was sitting next to some people, like two or three guys who yeah. who were geeking out <laughs> not necessarily like during the movie yeah um but like as we were waiting on the credits um they were they were just absolutely like breaking it all down yeah and yeah and, I, and think, I, I respected that yeah i think that's the great thing about this movie is there's plenty of stuff like that where you could lose your shit or like geek out but it's like almost done in such a way where it's it's like asking you not to almost like even with the dialogue in that scene like it's it's at a very normal level like they're almost kind of just like talking like at a normal volume between these two cells um and so like it's like it's like inviting you to like really lean in and like pay attention like uh who the hell is this is this who we think it is like and again it doesn't give you a clear image of him so it's kind of like asking you to kind of speculate almost but um, I feel I feel like with anything that there's an illusion here or there or references or things like that, it's it's not in your face or it's not like holy shit, like time, like let's have a pause in the action for you to cheer or anything like that. It's very much like just let's kind of make it subtle and then move on and like keep the story going and like keep it in in, in motion here. Um, and yeah, so there's I mean there's just a ton that could happen in the future. There's so much potential. There's Joker, Riddler, Penguin potentially Mr. Freeze, potentially Robin, potentially Court of Owls, Hush maybe. Like there's just so many avenues to go down. And, you know, Dylan Clark, the producer, last night he said at the world premiere, he said, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, we'll have a sequel within the next five years, (laughs) which is like, obviously like I would hope so. Holy shit. Um, Now I know with the Dark Knight trilogy, it was basically like every three and a half years, we got a new one. I think that sounds probably about right. Especially with these TV shows, I don't know what that what that's gonna do yeah. to 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 the timeline. Exactly. And I think they're writing the penguin show right now. That one's actually fairly close, I think, to like they're you know fully moving ahead on that. I'm super excited to see more of this world, more of this Gotham, more of this penguin, catwoman, Riddler, Joker, whoever else Matt Reeves wants to bring in. I say don't rush Matt Reeves. You didn't rush him with this one. You let him write a script, you let him take six months to finish apes you let him take six months to write the script you let him bring in a co-writer you let him come up with every single person he wanted to get involved he took his time let him do it again um because i think the only the only thing that's going to be tough after this is making a movie that is on the same level or better like trying to top it Um, but if anyone's up to the challenge i have no doubt matt reeves writing directing and producing uh with the with this cast and additional members i'm sure to come and this crew uh it's again similar to dune very similar in a lot of respects uh i think this is shaping up to be an all-time great trilogy um and this is already one of the all-time great superhero movies or comic book movies couldn't have said it better myself johnny what a movie (laughs) uh well hey man i can't 24 hours from now i'll be back in the theater i cannot wait absolutely cannot wait if you don't know by now we recommend it. Go ahead, head ahead, head out to the theater this weekend if you can, if you're feeling safe. Um, IMAX, Dolby, the bigger, the louder, the better. You will not, uh, you will not regret paying a little extra. Quick shouts, to quick shouts to the score. What a, what a. Oh my God! How did we score. not touch on the score? Holy shit! It was almost like it's so great. It's like you can't even bother saying anything about it because words are not going to do it justice. 
I've mm-hmm. listened to it a lot outside of the movie, not since I saw the movie, but leading up to it because it came out uh, like kind of in the last few days. It's a fantastic score on its own, but in the movie, it just elevates it to, a, it elevates the music to a whole nother level and it elevates the film to a whole nother level. So yeah, I, I um, had this, the same impression. Like I didn't listen to it. I'd listened to like the main theme uh, cause they'd released like three singles and then like, yeah. I didn't listen to like the full sound tr- or the full score until the day of. And like, I, I was really into it, but seeing it, hearing it alongside the movie, like it just took it to the next level. Um, it just fits so perfectly. And um, it, it, I, I, you're right. Words can't do it justice. You just have to hear it and you have to see it. Yeah, uh, 100%. So Michael Giacchino, maybe his best score ever. It's it's unreal. If he is not, I mean, we have a long ways to go. I said this on Twitter last night as well, but I'll make I'll mention it here because I'm the awards guy uh, at Inside the Film Room. Yeah, I'll be damned if this movie is not in the conversation 10 months from now with regards to awards. Michael Giacchino's score, Greg Frazier's cinematography. Book them now. Book them now. There's not going to be five movies this year with cinematography better than this movie. There's not going to be five scores better than than Michael Giacchino's score. So nominations at the minimum. And then production design, costume design. Um, I, I thought it, it's just gorgeous top to bottom. Makeup and hair. I mean, are you kidding me with the stuff that Mike Marino and his team did with Colin Farrell and as well as the rest of the cast? Um it, it techs at the minimum, but I think as great as the techs are, as great as, as the performance are, the casting, the writing, directing, Matt Reeves as a producer, as a writer, as a director, and the film itself needs to be in the conversation for writing, adapted, you know, adapted screenplay, maybe um, director, and then of course, best picture, especially at the Oscars with that expanded field of 10. Um, it, keep, it, keep this in mind, folks. This is, the, this is a high bar. It's been set now. I don't see anything coming even close to topping this until, uh, you know, festival season rolls around like October, September. So Mm -hmm. um, the bar is set and uh, keep, you know, just uh, I'll be, I'll be pushing it all damn year. That's for sure. So go out and see it. You will not regret it. I'm going to see it at least two more times opening weekend. And I'm sure I'll see it again after that. So um, this is, this is a special movie for this genre and in, in for films in general. I mean, honestly, there you have it go see the Batman. You will not regret it. We uh, laid it all out there for you. And you know what? I I am convinced that when you see it, you'll be just as enthusiastic about it as Johnny and I. But Johnny, talk to me. What what else were you enthusiastic about this week? Let the people know about Donnie Moe. Our good friend, Donald Mowit, he is, as Zach might've mentioned at the top of the show, uh, you know, makeup and hairstyling uh, extraordinaire. He has been in some of the best films and worked on some of the best films of the last decade or so, especially his collaborations with Denis Villeneuve on Sicario, uh, Prisoners, Blade Runner 2049, and Dune, which he got his first Oscar nomination for. Fantastic um, uh, work across the board uh, throughout his career. He's been in the industry for a long time. He's also worked on some James Bond films. He's been working with Jake Gyllenhaal, Mark Wahlberg, et cetera. So um, he, he knows his stuff. And I was very excited this week um, to, to sit down with him and have a conversation, an hour conversation uh, about Dune, about what he has coming up, what he's been working on. Um, and uh, it just really uh, a pleasure to speak with him again, have him uh, be a guest. Got some fun little tidbits out of him, maybe some exciting more you know, news. Um, but I'm uh, pleased to share that with you all and to get him back on the show to give you some, some exciting insights, especially with award season heating up in the Oscars uh, a, a month away. Let's dive in. Donald Moat here. Uh, we have the uh, makeup and hair designer extraordinaire uh, this season. He is up for awards all over the place, including the Oscars, his first ever Oscar nomination for Denny Villeneuve's Dune. I'm Johnny Sobchak, of course, the uh, chief writer here at Inside the Film Room. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, Donald, um, great to see you again, as, as, of, as of course we uh, kind of already touched on, but I know you're busy right now. You're working uh, overseas in Spain, so I really appreciate, again, you taking the time to 
connect and it's good to see you again. I know uh, some of our readers or listeners might be familiar with the last time that we actually spoke for the first time. Well, that was almost a couple of years ago now. Um, and we touched on a lot of different elements of your career, films you've worked on, people you've worked with, and we were looking forward to Dune. But at that point, it was still, it felt like a dream. It was still very far away at that point, even though you were pretty much complete with all your work on it. And we didn't get to talk on it very much. So I'm glad uh, at this point now, as, as, as I mentioned, award season is heating up. We're getting able to connect and go into some details. Of course, you've, you've done so many interviews, uh, especially in the last few months, I think, related to this film. So hopefully we're not treading any too much familiar ground. But uh I'm excited to, to dig into it. And again, good to see you. Nice to see you. We go way back now, it seems. <laughs> yeah, last couple of years are a blur. So it feels almost probably know. longer than it is. But um, yeah, very exciting. And um, yeah, well, first off, congratulations. Uh, and I mentioned this when we were f first getting into the call, but um, I have to brag just a little bit. When we first talked, I said that, hey, you're going to get Oscar nominated for this. I feel like you should have gotten recognition on this scale a long time ago, but I'm glad to finally see it now and it's it's come to you know fruition. You've gotten a number of honors over your career, but especially in the last few months, I feel like it's really, you know, it's kind of like we spoke about this before, and and I feel like it's important to keep that what you know this mantra in mind. And this is what I always say to everyone when we discuss awards, whether it's on Twitter or on on different you know websites, but it's not about the awards. It's about the work. And that's really the primary focus and, and how you feel about it and what the experience is like. So I try not to like put too much pressure on that or to, to emphasize that too much, but it is significant, especially for your career, I feel. And so just love to hear what the last few months have been like since the release of the film. And then in the last couple of months, specifically December, January, and now we're almost at the, you know, at the end of February, all these different, I mean, nominations here there are critics groups uh different awards bodies BAFTA who you're very familiar with you've been nominated there a couple of times and then now uh the academy um what has it been like is it I mean I'm sure it's been overwhelming I'm sure it's been somewhat of a whirlwind but I'd love to hear just your perspective and looking back and getting to this point now well it's really you know it's really obviously it's a very it's beyond nice you know it's an incredible honor and Look, I'm I'm thrilled, and you did call it, and I you've been you know so supportive and a good friend, you know since we spoke, and I know you love Dune, and I I love that you love it because there's a huge difference when you speak to people who, but you love movies, and I think and so do I, and I think that's the huge thing, that's mm. the common element of people who love movies, and and so I think when you and I first spoke, and you did say that to me, and I think people have you know, said, oh, you've never been nominated. People were quite surprised at that, which surprised me that people's reaction was, you know, that word I rarely use because I never quite know how to use it, incredulous. Hmm. I think that was the response from people. And when I started to get that feedback, I thought, well, you know, what does it mean? I, I was overwhelmed, yes, and honored. And I've been an Academy member since 1999. Um, and I, you know, I, I take it seriously. So I was... It was a, a great moment. I've been to the Bake Off. I've been a bridesmaid, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, but then you get to the nitty gritty of it. It just doesn't always work out. And I think you can't, you, you, you know, you got to buck up. There are moments you have to just say, look, it's not what it's about. Like you said, it's about the work. Mm. And you can really get yourself quite fooled by a lot of that stuff. And we go back to why we're in the business, why we do what we do. And you look at people like Peter O'Toole or Stanley Kubrick, not that I'm at all in their world or their league, but Peter O'Toole never won a competitive Oscar, nor did Stan, you know, nor did Richard mm -hmm. Burton. You know, Peter Rob King, makeup designer, extraordinaire. A lot of people, you know, didn't. There wasn't even a makeup category till 84, 83. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, for me, the fact that I've worked in feature films, motion pictures, for 35 years is the Oscar to me that I've I did TV when I felt like it or just an in-between I never sustained my I've sustained my life my livelihood since I was a very young man in feature films that's the Academy Award hmm. that should be the Academy Award yeah I mean that's a, an amazing way of, of putting it in perspective now some people might not realize this and and I we had discussed it previously but I wasn't totally clear on the, like the details of it but you actually had a position in the that branch at some point up until just you know last year or so um, and people might not know that so what exactly is your position there and 
kind of your experience with that. Also in, in keeping in mind that throughout, you know, the last decades when, when you've been working in the industry, you know, you, people were like, oh, you haven't been nominated. You know, you haven't, you know, gotten that kind of recognition while you're kind of working inside and kind of leading um, this group within, you know, makeup and, and hair. Well, you know, in, when I came to the Academy, I was so thrilled to be invited. It was, you know, we used to get, you got your letter and I was invited and I was, I think quite young, 1999, I remember it, and being proposed for membership, that was a huge thing. It used to be a huge, huge thing. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you get elected and voted on to be on an executive committee for which I served the maximum, which was 11 or 12 years. So I've been part of an executive committee on the academy. And then I was retired kind of a little bit abruptly last year, a lot of us, it was a little bit um, as, but you know what? I served my time. I did. I did my thing. I volunteered, uh, as many of us did. A, a number of us were, were told the academy is now having term limits. Um, mm. uh, that's fine. You know, I understand it. You go with with. We're moving forward, mm -hmm. and I, I'm. I believe in that. We're changing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, well, this is interesting, and of course, it's very interesting because then I was asked to run as a governor, and I chose not to. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what made me do that, but I do believe in volunteerism and you know that about me. It's a huge part of my life. And I just, you know, it's maybe come full circle for me as a longtime member of the Academy and BAFTA. And then this incredible movie that for me is like the pinnacle, I guess, for me of something so important. But as far as like not being nominated before, you know, yeah, there's a few films I kind of felt a little, you know, at the Bake Off, as you know, the Bake Off, mm -hmm. Visual effects and makeup are very hard to get nominated. The fact that you even get into the world, now sound are doing it, by the way. They have a bake-off, um, all because of us. They must be very angry. Um, <laughs> but you know, the Academy love it. And I think many other branches love it because it's a spectacle, but it's also the love of movies. And I think to defend the bake-off, which I didn't always, mm -hmm. is also to say that you must watch the films you must as a branch see the films and show the clip of 10, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I've been to the Bake Off for The Fighter and a couple of other films and you don't always make it. And, and so you're, there are hurt feelings. So I think this time to go to the Bake Off, last year was the little things. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone who gets to a Bake Off to even get on the long list is huge. So I think there's a number of things for me that are, you know, you can't always make it, you can't get there. And some people are very lucky and have had these incredible careers that get to the Bake Off a lot. Some people get nominated, but we all know really the Oscars, it's a, it's a thing, but really it's about the work. It's just about the work, whether you have the nomination or don't have the, I've always worked. And, and this is a, a nice thing, you know, um, I just love working and I'll continue to work with or without it. I'm, it's a huge thing. My good friend Roger Deakins won an Oscar after what 14 nominations. It didn't yeah. <laughs> really, you know, but I think it's important for people to know that I think we're very humbled and honored by it and that my peers nominated me and my team. I mean, it's everybody. Uh, so it's a huge thing for me. And a lot of people are very happy. They're very, very happy for me. And I'm very happy that they're happy. And and uh I'm not making light of it at all because it's mm -hmm. a huge thing. And I was a little bit emotional when it happened mm -hmm. and I was in the middle of working. So, yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, and count me, of course, <laughs> you know, chief among those that it was looking forward to that, that time when you finally got your name in there. Um, now, the last thing I'll touch on with regards to the Academy before we move on to more Dune uh, discussion is, and feel free to comment on this as much or as little as you want to, but I can't not address right. it is the, uh, we're talking about moving forward, the Academy going through a lot of changes, reshuffling, yeah. and one of those primary or most talked about and controversial um, changes that is, is going on at least at the moment, and we'll see if anything comes of, of lighter changes with regards to it before the ceremony happens, but eight of the categories are going to be basically from the details that have been released so far, eight of the categories, including film editing, production design, sound, as you mentioned, and makeup and hairstyling, uh, are going to be part of those that are going to be um, presented and recorded prior to the ceremony beginning, the telecast beginning, prior to many of the may maybe more high profile or A-list 
uh, members being inside the room to uh, do the uh, recipients for those awards. And then they are going to be edited um, into the telecast and they're going to try to mask it. So it looks like it's normal. It looks like it's going to be um, part of the, uh, the integral live happening live, uh, you know, ceremony. And in addition to that, not only are they going to actually do that recording um, previously and then edit it in and, and, you know, broadcast it later on, but they're actually going to announce those winners prior to the telecast even starting. They're going to announce these eight winners while the red carpet's ongoing and before the show actually begins. Um, what are your thoughts, if any, about that? Um, you know, there's been a lot. I mean, I know the, fil the film American uh, film editors, they already released a statement saying that they completely kind of disagree with that and hope that the Academy changes their mind. There's been a lot of dissent among, you know, even cinematographers, other people where they work in branches that aren't going to be included in these eight, but they're still saying, how can you kind of, delegate that these ones are not going to be on the same level or they deserve right, to be placed right. into this this category whereas these other ones aren't um and even original score and that's another one that is in this group yeah, um, yeah. And of course Hans Zimmer is up for Dune among other very high profile you know composers like Nicholas Bertel and Johnny Greenwood so and they're talking about potentially there's a rumor that they might just boycott and not even show up to the ceremony so what is it's so much to kind of break down but just any basic thoughts that you might have about it or feelings you know, look, I, 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 there are many things on my mind. I understand people's upset and disappointment. I really do. Mm -hmm. I, you know, look, it's been coming for a long time. I'm not defending the position that's been taken, mm -hmm. nor do I think it's entirely correct. But I don't think it's for me to take a position. I feel like we're members of an organization. There's a lot of us, many, many thousands of us. I think the board, it's, I mean, I think the, the, the fairest thing is to say is it, it's been coming for a long time. None of us are really that shocked. In mm. fact, there was a number of years ago, in fact, they brought nominees up on stage and one person had to stand. Remember that? <laughs> you, know, year, you see, I go that far back. Then there was a year where makeup was presented in the aisle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just saw clips of that. <laughs> it's not that new. It's not that new. Is it outrageous? Yes. Now, where I do have an issue is is there some kind of certain categories? Yes, it's unfortunate. And will they rotate? Probably. Mm -hmm. My understanding is they'll rotate. Um, will it change the outlook of the show and the ratings? No, of course it won't. I know that. <laughs> we all know it. But you know what? People have to make whatever they need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we have to go back to, well, I'll get in terrible trouble, won't I? But why don't we just go back <laughs> to the 1920s and 30s and just have it as a hotel lunch? and mm -hmm. forget everything and, mm -hmm. and put it back in pr perspective. What would be interesting to me is if they had dropped one of the main top four categories. Right. And that would be very interesting to me to say, okay, let's really do this. Let's show some real hashtag equality and democracy. Um, but we're not. So uh, where it gets tricky is you have one category versus another and why is this and not that and that's unfortunately what's happening and i am a man of the people so look they've made a choice um i'm very happy to be nominated i think it, at best i leave it at that and say mm -hmm. look uh you know it's a it's a strange separate but equal isn't it it's a very yeah. strange thing. and I, it's put us all in a terrible situation the same way as having the term limits. It didn't change anything. In fact, it's disenfranchised people like me who are older people who also identify with being over a certain age group or uh, LGBTQ plus or people who are of color or yeah. of, I think people are starting to forget that, you know, we're putting, we're disenfranchising certain people by virtue of not trying to do that. Mm. And so I think when people volunteer and have the integrity to volunteer to a committee or an organization, it's it's very upsetting to then have that happen. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, my peers and my governors of our branch worked diligently, diligently of their own time unpaid, which people must understand, to nominate and spend time watching films on our behalf to then nominate us. So I it's very hard to criticize people who have tried to do the best they can where they're looking at three, whatever it is, three hours. I'd be very happy if we just did it at a lunch and just called it a day. That's, <laughs> that's me. I'm happy to say I'm nominated for an Oscar. It took 35 years, we'll come, you know, mm -hmm. but um, I know people are very upset and I don't disagree with them. I really don't disagree with them. 
you know, it's okay. a fair thing. It's very fair. Absolutely. No, that's a very uh, level-headed response because it's, it is, I think the people, you know, speaking from someone who is in the world of, you know, journalism and, and film writing and these people that I talk to and interact with on social media, et cetera. Yeah. There's a lot of pushback because it's, it's, you're trying to appeal to a certain audience, potentially you're trying to bring in a certain audience, but these changes don't, aren't, don't, don't feel like they're going to result in that, <laughs> that action that you're wanting to have happen. I just don't think cutting that any, uh, you know, a micro amount of time, um, and then also disservicing these different artists and groups, um, you know, just doesn't, doesn't add up or make sense to me. So we'll see what happens. Ultimately, I hope that they change their minds. But as you said, the luncheon idea <laughs> does not televising at all. I mean, that's the funny thing about this is, if you're going to announce a third of the categories on social media before the show even starts, why not just announce it for all of them like that and just go away with the whole show? Like it just doesn't, uh, doesn't really make sense, but that's all right. I, I appreciate your response to that. So we'll, we'll move on. But with regards to Dune, um, I think people at this point know you were the head uh, of the makeup and hair prosthetics, um, everything with regards to that department, that branch on Dune. And, uh, you know, I've been looking forward to this film for a long time. We discussed it, like I said, almost a couple of years ago now. And when we discussed it previously, there were some details that you shared and, and we got into a little bit, but not too deeply. So going back all the way to when you were first getting on board for the film, I know what we discussed is that you had kind of a decision to make. Am I going to go, am I going to do this like kind of final Bond film potentially with Daniel Craig because you had worked with him previously, you had a really wonderful relationship and experience with that. Um, but then you also worked with Denis previously and it was kind of a big decision that you had to kind of make. Um, what was that ultimately like when you when you weren't um, you know when you were first meeting with Denis and maybe he was approaching you about getting on board? What was kind of the determining factor that said, okay, I'm I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to go in this direction and I'm not going to, you know, I can't think too much about the alternative or, or you know get dwell on what what might be if I if I go another route. Well, you know, it's very difficult. Sometimes I would normally never even discuss it. I mean, outside of just my own personal. Uh, life, but I think with the amount of delays, I'm I'm so fond of everybody there, and you know Barbara Broccoli and Daniel, mm -hmm. of course, like been a a truly good friend to me in a business that's very hard. You know, to it's it's so difficult. Um, he's just been one of the greatest people I've ever known in, in the industry uh, to me. But the film delayed, delayed, delayed. I mean, that's mm -hmm. look, things happen. Nobody does it. No one does it intentionally. Well, then we had mm -hmm. a pandemic, so then. You know, who knew the films would release the <laughs> so close to each other? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, then come the Oscar nominations and films like I have a team members who had films coming out uh, that all fell into each other. Uh, no, I think the delay was, you know, multiple delays of that were just enough for me to go. I got to work, too. Mm -hmm. And we all, you know, there is a reality. And then there's a sign. I, I guess sometimes I do think I have a. a uh, you know, I'm not a new age person at all. I'm very practical in many respects in my life. And I just have a, a gut reaction to go, you know, kind of, that's it. It's delayed, delayed, delayed. And I think I was still on Spider-Man when mm. I kept reading the paper, another delay. And finally you go, okay, guys, this is not, you know, a bird in the hand kind of thing. And by mm. the time Denise called me and said, are you like, what are you doing? <laughs> And, and when he said that, I thought this is, a, anyway, long story short, that's what I did. And, I, you know, um, it happens. And I think it happens to everyone in the business, one person mm -hmm. and at every level. And, you know, whether you're working at his level or at the level of, of, of you know, movie stars or directors, producers, even at the level of below the line, what I do, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who say, actually, if it doesn't start here, I, I got to go, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's it. Uh, and uh, that's what I did. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point you you raised because I think a lot of people, I mean, due to the pandemic and all these different delays that have happened associated with that, I think if people kind of almost forget No Time to Die, the, you know, the most recent Bond film with Daniel Craig's kind of farewell was, it was already getting delayed multiple times prior to even pandemic even being yeah. a thing because there was so much, um, as far as the production, the route that they were going to go with the director and the writing and everything, there was a lot of kind of, waiting around so that that certainly makes sense why you would kind of be like I need to I just need to make a decision and, and I can't really wait too much longer um 
and so, you know, getting into that the first discussion with Denis, and we talked about this, you kind of, you met him and I think, you think we mentioned like it was Santa Monica or something and you sat down and it was, okay, the, the primary concern, at least as far as makeup and hair was the Baron. How are we going to do this? And originally I know it's been mentioned elsewhere at this point, it was conceived potentially as a CG creation. The VFX team might get involved and they were just going to do motion capture, performance capture. The first initial discussion with Denis, at what point was it determined, you know, I, this is what I can present to you. This is what we can do. What was his reaction to that? Cause I know, I mean, knowing him, I'm sure he probably wanted to be as practical as possible. Um, but what was that first initial discussion like with him just making that determination and coming to a point where you felt comfortable? I think he was curious to know. There was talk of it. I think they were still figuring out who the actor, I think it was, there was discussions going on. I, I would hate to be misquoted because there, there were discussions, I believe at that point with Stalin. Um, mm -hmm. And that was something he wanted as well, but certainly didn't, we're always practical, always in camera since I've known him. Mm -hmm. uh, and that matters. And I think we talked about like, this can be a practical makeup. I'm very proud of that action. I think it's something we don't talk about or I haven't seen really very much. Um, it's not really for the press to cover. It's for me to say, but I think we really did bring back a practical makeup that we don't see in films very often. And, and I really want us to kind of feel that um, when we talk about science and technology and, and with the Academy, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, that we, we really did something that's not been done for a long time is coming back to not only creating a new world, but also using the latest in technology and, and doing the best we could also with practical makeup, coming back to prosthetic makeup, getting the best people around with sculpting, with practical makeup. And so Denis was very keen that we could try this. He treated it as an experiment. That's how, what we called it. Mm -hmm. So we got the first couple of ideas and I, we, I went back to him with Apocalypse Now and Dr. Moreau and all these things which have come out 10 different times. And I went, well, I threw in a couple of even, you know, Cardinal Richelieu because you have to have lots of ideas because the first, when I first pitched it, it did come back kind of, I think I, I had the idea in my head that it could be like jowls mm -hmm. and you could do a chest. Cause I remember on another film where we did have a chest and he was warming to it, but then I think there was a sketch he didn't like. Mm. And I think it kind of, you could see a moment where he would go. And I think we put hair, like stringy hair, and he didn't like it. And he said, no matter what, the Baron has to be bald, which is how the Harkonnen ended up bald. And, you know, that's how something is born. That is the true birth of, of creating a character is you choose, make a choice, and then everything else falls in a sort of domino effect. Mm -hmm. But I remember then when I started hiring different people for different jobs, when I called Louvé and, and said, look, I think, I think I need you to make the suit. It started where I kind of like tricked him into something where I said, you know, it's just going to be a belly and blah, 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 because you got to, <laughs> you got to get people to do things for you and get them excited. Um, but as it grew literally and figuratively, it grew bigger and bigger that Denise saw that we could do this when I presented that, yeah, but fat can be funny and we're not fat shaming. Mm -hmm. And then what, and so I did show him like Little Britain and other things where you go, Mike Myers, that's funny. It's brilliant, but it's funny. And it's sick funny and not everyone's gonna find it funny. And mm -hmm. it's not today. And the Baron, and then the gorilla. So we found something of a gorilla and Patrice is, you know, his, Patrice Vermette, who's just extraordinary production designer and the storyboard, they're working months before we are. And I saw something of a gorilla and I grabbed onto that. And you start marrying everybody's ideas and images. And that's how that came to become the Baron. Yeah, I mean, it is incredible how that domino effect kind of happens. You just make one decision based on one inkling of a thought and then it everything else will just fall into place after that. And I loved, I mean, you, you just mentioned Louvet. 
you know, the profiles of Louvet Larson and then his wife, um, Eva von Baer, like they, they have grown in recent years. I mean, they were nominated a couple of times, I know for the hundred year old man and a man called Ove. Um, you said you kind of felt like you kind of tricked him a little bit just initially to see, you know, how he might respond. How was it, you know, what was their kind of response or their feeling when you first reached out to them? Um, what kind of led you? Cause of course, I'm sure when you're making these decisions, you're thinking about, okay, who could I get for this? Who, who would I feel comfortable with collaborating in this element of it? Um, what were those initial discussions like with them kind of determining their level of interest and their ability and just making sure, cause that's such a big responsibility for that particular character, making sure that you were both on the right page and, and everyone felt like confident we can do this. Well, you know, it was huge. I mean, Lube works with me quite a bit. I brought him on other projects with me. So I feel like he likes, I work, we work well together. I think that uh, it, he comes on and sort of like, there'll be a project I'm, I'm doing or involved with it. I'll have something that's interesting for him. So I propose it saying, look, I want to try to pitch you to the studio and to Denis because we've never had this big a prosthetic and Denise mm -hmm. never really had a big prosthetic movie of, of that. Well, very few people have a prosthetic movie of that <laughs> size and caliber. And so I had to really sell it. Now then they're not, they're not really known in, in Hollywood, in LA. They did these great movies. They're incredible what they do, but it's a small, small shop. What really got it going for me was the fact that we had Stellan. Now we all know each other from Dragon Tattoo. And so I, you connect the dots, you go, this is sort of meant to be. And that's how I kind of go, well, I know Stellan, he knows me, Luve, Ava. So suddenly it all made sense. And I've got an, a captive audience because Stellan will do anything. And you've got an actor who's ready, who will go in to do a full day of life casting, not even break for lunch, maybe a cup of coffee. And so when I went back to Denis and Joe Caracciola, our producer, and said, okay, how about this? I've got this going on. And everybody kind of went, oh my God, like, you know, they, they know me. I'm very headstrong. Once I get them, and Denis is like, okay, I trust you. But it took a minute because you're, you're pushing an idea and then it's got to go by a number of people. And I think once they saw the wheels working and the practicality that by the time Stalin went for a life cast and they started seeing that I would just, just leave me alone. Just let me do my thing. You're going to be good. And between myself and Luve, we, it worked. And that was it. Very few directors, I just have to just interject with this. There are very few people that actually let you do what you know how to do in this business, just saying. <laughs> and there are a lot of people who, who don't stay in their lane and they would interfere. And I have to say once, you know, Herb and everybody, we were in Jordan at this point, giving them a progress report every week with visuals. Uh, they were very impressed. And I think I said, look, we'll have a camera test. And once they saw the camera test, I believe in April, they were very, very happy. And it didn't shoot till June. So that was wow. the way to, to do it. We were very, very, the stars aligned, not shooting till the end of the picture, time, money, not every production has that. So we're very lucky. And, and that's Denis, that's his vision and his leadership and really exquisite taste because he trusts when he gives you something to take on. Yeah, the stars aligning, I feel like is the only real way to describe this, this film, this project so far. Um, and you were just talking about when you got to that level, okay, this, I'm thinking this is gonna work. Was there a yeah. particular moment, a particular day where you you finally like breathe a sigh of relief and you felt okay they're they're comfortable with it we're confident and then we're going to be moving forward you mentioned april but what was that kind of situation like actually going through that i think when so we went to jordan for i don't know five or six weeks we established you know javier bardem we did all that other quite a lot of work actually uh i think when we got into camera tests with i think second unit with with stalin i'm not sure back in budapest I think that was in our world of David DeSmallchin. I don't think even Dave Batista we did a camera test with. Um, I think once we saw that camera test, I felt like we were good. Denise said, this is a great success, my friend. <laughs> I could see that Luve had lost 10 pounds. I think I gained. <laughs> I felt like everybody, I mean, had just 
what they did was extraordinary engineering. I mean, they had to create, they had to keep their ovens on all night. They had to go into the shop all night long. They were afraid to set the place on fire, you know, because mm. they had to bake the foam, right? They had to keep it going all night. Um, so we had to bring sculptors in from all, you know, many different places. So I think that there was so much more that happened. And then I had a lot of stuff going on, just crewing and, you know, there's a point in the film where you kind of go, this is, we're done, we're good. Mm. Then you just handle the day-to-day -day things. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and moving on from, the Baron is like the crown jewel of this film. I think everyone would kind of agree as far as makeup and, and prosthetics and everything. But with regards to, I mean, this is such a massive production, um, just uh, hundreds of, of people uh, involved. And just, that's just in the cast, people in front of the camera. Um, with regards to, and, and the other element to this, from your perspective, I, I feel just creating character, creating a world, you have so many different factions or groups of characters, whether it's the Atreides, Harkonnens, Sardaukar, Fremen, um, and they all have quite different aesthetics and looks and, and appearances. What, what really, uh, looking at it from like a macro perspective maybe, was the decision-making process and thought process with these different fa factions and how to make them distinct and how to you know add in little little details and and overall that kind of process i'm sure a lot of that was talking to denis um trying to get the right look for each group but just looking at it kind of overhead what was that like taking that on because i feel like honestly you don't see that in many films um uh, you know really ever so i feel like looking at your you know, career, this is really the first time we had to approach it from that point of view. We're like, okay, we have these many different groups, Bene Gesserit, you know, other, other elements. So how are we going to distinguish these? And that's also, of course, working in, in conjunction, not only with Denis, of course, is like, you know, the, the leader, but then also these different departments that are also helping create an aesthetic, whether it's costume or production design. Well, it is the most collaborative job I've ever been on. I mean, to work with, with Jacqueline West and Bob Morgan and Greg Fraser, Fraser, excuse me, and every department, Paul Lambert, because there's overlaps with every department creatively as one designer HOD to another. I mean, I'd go over to costume almost every day. They'd come to me, Stacey Horn, the costume supervisor, Greg. I mean, every, there was always something, even props, you know, I mean, those things, you know, the uh, transmitters, mm. um, there were little things, there were bigger things. I mean, I'd have to say once the Baron was done, it's big in volume and once it's set, but of course, once it's set, it plays fewer days than other things. Then you have things that play all the time that you have to focus on as far as continuity and matching, like Rebecca and Timmy. Sardaukar, like you said, they're numbers and, and they're a lot of background. Um, mm. But working, I mean, certainly Jackie and Bob set the tone and Patrice really, I think, sets the tone really with Denis of the, the film because they work on a kind of lookbook early on, sending photographs. A lot of what they send to me early on doesn't end up in my world. They kind of, makes me laugh sometimes because well, along with the storyboard people, and we went through this on, on uh, other films, but they'll send me things that I kind of look at and go, okay, yeah, but this doesn't work for me. Um, <laughs> It, it'll be an interesting idea. It'll be, a, say, a tattoo, but I'm like, yeah, but that won't work. So that's kind of how it works for me, where I'll see something and then I go back to them with something that's sort of a counter offer. Mm -hmm. And I kind of love that with Denis because it's a bit of tennis, you know, where he'll send something. I don't know what it would be. It'll be like a line across somebody's face and I'll go back and go, no, how about <laughs> this? And we sort of do that. And that's how the Mentat came for me or this thing, mm. which actually took way longer than you'd ever want to believe. <laughs> I sort of did. I had a moment with that to come up with. Um, or little tattoos and shout out mapes on, you know, the Fremen tattoos. Mm -hmm. Javier Bardem was a lot harder than it appears. He was a lot of work to figure him out and to work with Javier by phone and WhatsApp and to come up with that and give him an organic sort of look that's different than you've seen him before with no prosthetics. I mean, it's just makeup. It's pure makeup. Um, and that's a lot of fun. That's a real challenge of, of the art and the craft of what we do. Um, but working with everybody, this was the most collaborative job and really pleasant because we all like each other. And I mean, it's not a joke. It's not, 
you know, disingenuous. Every member, like every HOD is someone I like to work with or be around. So it's not like, oh God, I gotta go see so-and-so. We, <laughs> we do enjoy each other's company and we see each other, you know, usually outside of work, so. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I love the point you made about like just the little details, whether it's the men tat, like lip or the, the Fremen tattoos. One, one element that I, I found out about, and this was actually in the uh, Tanya's book that she wrote for the, the film. Um, this is a little detail of the serial numbers on the starter car. Um, just And she, it's just kind of like a little footnote, but that particular detail, I love those little things where maybe the audience, especially general audience, they'll never think twice about it or they'll never really realize or process what that means or what that is. But those are some of my favorite things that that come up in these films, especially with your work. So just talk about, can you talk a little bit about that serial number, the way you developed that and how that ended up into the film? And was there any other little details like that where I know you mentioned again, the Mentat lip or the little Fremen tattoos, just the process of developing like a meaning for that, how it factors into the overall aesthetic or the look of well, the, the character. I'm sure I got messed with with that because I know that when I went up to Patrice's office to Alana, who, who handles all things art department, I would go up to have things printed, right? Because we had our trailer outside. And so what happens is, you know, like anything, you'll be multitasking and you'll have a moment where you think you're, I'll be working on one thing. And as I go to do that thing, I, I see something and I'm completely distracted and I'm completely obsessed about something else. So I was working on the Mentat. And as I went upstairs, I was looking at the Sardaukur because they painted in red on their costume. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very interesting. And that got me thinking about their makeup because Denis wanted a lot of them to have broken noses, which I thought, well, we can do that pretty easily with mm -hmm. just a couple of pieces, super simple. And they'd be beat up and, and kind of tougher looking sort of Hungarian guys with tough looks and beards. Mm -hmm. And then I saw their language. I mean, there was like alphanumeric things that Patrice would have been using for graphics. And I just completely like plagiarized it. I saw all of it up there. And I went, well, they've got this number in red. Why am I not putting something? Because I had that in my head that somebody had a line across their face or their head or their, well, of course they're in suits. So that was my thing. I'm taking one of those and I'm putting it across the head because a bit like a barcode, which you've seen yeah. in too many movies. But it would work in this case because Denis normally, we don't go for tattoos, but in this case he would. And I presented it to him and he loved it. And that's what we did. Uh, the Mentat came similarly because I looked at pictures of staining mm -hmm. and I even tried something with like, not cool, like what's that candy we used to have? You put a stick in <laughs> powder. Uh, yeah, yep, the uh, candy like rock with the, the yeah, powder. <laughs> I, no, this is a bad idea. And it just, as I was doing that, that's when that came to me was sort of, why am I, why are we doing this? It just, mm. it should be a tattoo. It should be an intentional marking, not by accident, mm. an intentional mark in the color of wine. And that's how that came to be. Yeah, that's, that's just so funny because you would never, like, I don't know if that would ever cross my mind because in the book, yeah, they do have like these stains from this, this in, like stuff they're ingesting basically. Um, so I, yeah, I thought that that was a really interesting and kind of like unique, like alteration or like take on that. Um, now, of course, one thing that kept sticking in my mind with regards to this movie was, uh, and I haven't really seen it touched on at all was, I mean, you're in the desert. I mean, there was a significant portion of this when you're, and we talked about this a little bit last time when you're out in Jordan and, and you're climbing over these rocks and it's, it's probably like kind of hot out, um, one thing I, I would think about is if you're out in the hot desert and the sun's beating down, and of course you guys went out at times of the day where it was it, it, as little exposure to that as possible, whether it was very late in you know, the evening or early in the morning. Um, but what challenges does that physical environment offer with regards to makeup and hair? Because you're not in a controlled space. You're out in the wild. I mean, one of the most wild terrains you'll ever find on the planet as far as sweating and just the different, the wind and, and what challenges does that offer making up all these different actors? And, and of course there's an element of that where you kind of want them to look sweaty. You kind of want them to have this kind of look, but you want it to be specific and controlled. Yeah. What was that like with these actors standing around for or running around the desert for potentially hours at a time? Well, what's interesting in the desert is that 
you actually don't, well, you do perspire, but you don't see it because it evaporates. <laughs> and I learned that a long time ago. And I think I've explained it uh, to people before. So no matter what happens, which is very interesting when we did Timmy and Rebecca, um, it's very cold, as you know, on the desert at certain mm. time of day. And then it's very hot. Well, not dissimilar to California. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I, I found was interesting challenge with the Fremen and everything. You see how they're wrapped up and they're in the still suits. And But what I did notice was trying to, it was harder to make them look dry. And uh, the, the look of what the desert actually does to people, there's a dust blows over everybody. The thing with actual perspiration is problematic because they don't, it's all absorbed. So you start asking yourself questions like, but it's absorbed, the still suit, you start questioning all kinds <laughs> of things. But I learned that years ago on a job in the desert thinking, but you don't actually see perspiration in the desert. So all those Westerns you saw as a kid are quite incorrect <laughs> because you absorb it. It's so hot, you can't see it, you're bone dry. That's what I learned. And that's why I gave Timmy and Rebecca the very dry chapped lips mm -hmm. and dust all over them because you wouldn't be perspiring and you're in a still suit. That water is absorbed. These are the things you learn. You go, oh my God, I can't believe my life is this. But <laughs> it is. Uh, I love that. Yeah, I never would have. I mean, it makes perfect sense, but yeah, I never once considered that. Um, and then additionally, there's another element to the film that, and not just with regards to like the desert, everything that's going on out there, but and it's kind of a, a more of an icky, grotesque like subject of it, but it's really not even with regards to this film in particular, but your other work with Denis and your other work in, a, in other films. And, and that, this is the best compliment, one of the best compliments I feel like I can offer is you do the work, the work you and your team do with regards to blood and injuries and wounds is like the best that I see in movies. I feel especially... I mean, this is a this is a PG thirteen movie, but I feel like there's as much blood as you'll see in a PG thirteen movie in this movie with the swords and everything. But your work, whether I'm thinking about Sicario, I'm thinking about Paul Dano and his character in Prisoners, um, mm -hmm. you know the the injuries that Kay endures in Blade Runner twenty forty nine with you know with Ryan, and and this one, I mean, there's images that really stick in my mind, especially with regards to just the color of the blood and those, those visions that Paul has where it's the hand covered in blood or the, the, the knife covered in blood. What, you know, how do you and your team go about getting that proper look that's so, for me, it's just so visceral and kind of tangible. Whereas I see blood in other movies, it just feels, doesn't have the quite right color, maybe just the right consistency or just a wound that doesn't look, you know, accurate. What is kind of the process that you go through with that? Not even just with this movie, maybe, maybe in general or things you've developed to this point. Well, you know, it's it's such a great question. Sometimes it's beyond your control. Uh, sometimes you really have no, it's being corrected in post, mm -hmm. which is you know, very annoying. And, and I mean, I loved in Blade Runner 2049, I really loved that I got so much freedom to do what I do. And people just left me alone. Nobody really interfered. And I kind of love that. And you just like, whatever. Um, <laughs> it was great. And I love that when it had to be pink or when there's the whole joy thing and, that whole sequence with Ryan, I kind of loved it because of course mm -hmm. it's good pink. It reflects on him. And um, I, I love that. I felt like very rarely do, do people interfere when I think they trust what you're doing. I don't interfere with other people. Uh, why would they do that with me? I think there's a tendency, I will say, out there in the world of makeup and hair that people do that more so than other departments. Well, maybe that's not true. Costume, I think people interfere with because everyone mm -hmm. becomes an expert. But rarely would somebody go to the cinematographer and say, well, I would be using this mm -hmm. to do that light. I just think people don't know, but uh, or they'd be too embarrassed. Um, but I, I like to research it, but I also, I think you have to be brave and, and I think you just have to be brave and do things even, you know, you have to know you're taking license. It's not real, of course it's not. And sometimes real doesn't look right. Authentic mm. does not, you know, you look at a, we've all cut ourselves and, and you look at a real bruise and it would look terrible if you, you know, you recreated that and put that on film, it would mm. look awful. You got to juice it up. It's a movie. You, you, <laughs> reima you reimagine it. Mm -hmm. How would this really look? Um, so I like to do things that are a little, you know, um, and then you have to imagine how you match it. How do you showcase that for a long period of time? Mm -hmm. You know, keep it off the center of the face maybe, or 
what are you going to do? Like Paul's hair, like trying to match his hair was, it was tricky. It doesn't always match. It's impossible. That's the physics, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's great to stand him in front of a fan and get the guys to throw dust <laughs> and Timmy's game. You can put him in front, turn it on, and he'll. Do, you're not going to match that hair with hair product, are you? Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. <laughs> um, so that's what you do. You got to yeah. be great. You got to be really commando. I mean, I do that on, on most movies. You got to be with the right actor. But if somebody's like, oh my God, I'm going to break a nail, you know, <laughs> with that type of actor or actress, it's never. I mean, Rebecca will do anything. You can just like, can you just roll around in the dirt? She'll do it. <laughs> Match. And I've done it. I've said to both of them, can you please, you know, run your hands through that sand again? It's mm -hmm. you're too clean. They'll do it for me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's again, that's what's the beauty of movies is just so collaborative. If you're, you know, you need someone that is, or, or can we meet minds here? Can we, can we agree that this is what yeah. needs to happen yeah. to make this work? And, and also your point about realism as well. I know, I think that's something that a lot of people touch on. And we've talked about before, just Denise's commitment to making it grounded, having some sort of reality you can kind of latch on to. But that doesn't necessarily work for every single thing. I think, you know, talking specifically about makeup and hair and wounds and blood and things like that you know, it has to be real to a point, but you might also need to embellish it or elevate it because it's, it's not real. It's a movie. So you, you, you have, you have to yeah. appeal to the camera and to the viewer's eye, um, which yeah. is, you know, requires a little bit more work potentially. Um, also, I just wanted to, just one thing mm -hmm. I, I've always found that um, the one thing in terms of like blood and casualty, the thing that I always try to stress in films, and I've really been very strict with actors and directors when something's fatal, it's not necessarily bloody. When something is really fatal, it's actually quite clean because mm -hmm. that's a head wound, right? That can mm -hmm. be, when there's blood, it, there's a, often life in that. And mm -hmm. it took me a long time to also gain the confidence to be able to rise up to the level to say to a director, it happened to me on Nightcrawler actually with Riz Ahmed, you know, when he's lying there mm -hmm. and like, oh, he should be bloody. I'm like, well, why? Like, why? What's the point? I mean, mm -hmm. people fall and hit their heads and they die. Mm -hmm. And there's no blood. That's why they die. <laughs> right. There was no blood. Or when you see a drip of blood from the ear is really, that's something. That's when there's yeah. something really Lying. seriously wrong. Mm -hmm. But when you get the gushing wounds like K and Blade Runner 2049, it's surface, you know. So I quite like playing with things like that. And I think there's a, a moment when you see a face or something very serious has happened where they just, the heart stops and the face just goes, you know, and I like playing with things like that. And there's something quite beautiful about it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's very hard to gain. And I tell a lot of newer people that because they don't, it's very hard to gain that confidence to go to a director or an actor and say, why would you be sweaty? We're like, why? <laughs> I don't understand that. Yeah, yeah, that's movie. I mean, it's, yeah, it's again, finding that I love how you kind of illustrate that just finding that balance between mo what's good for the movie, what's real, what would actually happen. Um, and I think that that's such a great element to bring into something like Dune in particular, because it's such a can be such a fantastical and, and it's science fiction, yeah, and, yeah. And all these different worlds and things. But having that reality on any level, I think it just works in the viewer's mind. So um, to wrap up with Dune, before you touch on a couple of your upcoming projects, just hearing about uh, what, what you have on the horizon. With part two, it's, you know, I mean, there's so much going on in the world right now. Obviously, um, you know, the part two is, it does have the green light. We found that out shortly after the film, um, you know, was released and they are set to, you know, start production this summer in Jordan, the Middle East and, and in Hungary again. Um, a lot of the cast and crew have said that, of course, they're gonna be returning. Some of them, you know, Timothy Chalamet is not, not going to come back for Dune Part 2, of course. That would be a little uh, uh, troublesome. But you have, you know, Patrice, I know, is, is coming back. Greg Frazier, uh, you know, Hans Zimmer. Um, can, are you able to, I know you, you're just so busy. You have so much work going on. You're, you know, with award season, other projects that you're doing. Are you able, with any confidence at this point, to say, you know, with comfortability that I can see myself going ahead and, and returning to work with this cast and crew on this movie with Denis Villeneuve? Um, is that something that you feel like you can return and lend your talents to that project? Or is that, you know, are you kind of still in the, in the headspace between the two and not totally sure? Um, I would like, to, yes, I will be, I will be going back. Yes. 
the, the desert needs you. So I think that's, that's certainly, uh, Music. I think I, man, I think I need them. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I think it would be, yeah. I think it'd be very hard not to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's when you develop those relationships, like you said. I mean, you know, seeing that even outside of work, you just have such a strong, strong bond. I know Greg Fraser. He was saying in an interview recently as well, where he was just saying, you know, you you have such a strong relationship. Talking about Dune in particular, that you you know you want to get back to work with those 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 folks and. So I think yeah. it's great, um, yeah. you know, and there's that element too, where I think originally when Denis um, was originally con conceptualizing Dune as, as an adaptation, you know, he wanted to do two parts, of course, but he was considering if he could lobby them to do it all together, yeah. film yeah. it all at once. Yeah. Great. I think gratefully for him, as he has said already, and maybe for, probably for you as well and everyone else involved, it's nice that you didn't try to do it all at once because that's such a massive undertaking to get a little bit of a rest or just to get removed from that world for a little bit. But I think it would certainly be, you know, it would still be great, but I think it would be a little detrimental if not, you have such a great group of folks working on that first one to kind of, you know, it's lightning in a bottle bottle almost, but to get that back, just to get everyone kind of back on the same page, if they're feeling like up, up for the challenge, I think that that is, of course, what everyone would love to see. Um, and that's in front of the camera as well as behind the camera and, and everything yeah. that you and your team do. So um I'm sure that'll be music. That's music to my ears. I'm sure it'll be music to the ears of uh, Dune fans as well. Um, so that that's very exciting. Now, with regards to just briefly touch on these, I know you can't talk too much about them, but you have Ambulance uh, coming out, and and of course you got to yeah. work with Jake again on that. And you know, you I love seeing your collaborations with him. Worked many times before. Now you've done films with action in them. You've done now. Have you done a full on action film? I don't know if I would say that necessarily. I mean, Spider Man, of course, and then Moon Knight, but Bayhem. Michael Bay, <laughs> that's a whole nother level as, as you've kind of alluded to before. So what was it like uh, getting to work with the man himself and then uh, just uh, ambulance? It's just a fun, it's kind of an original concept. It's not a super movie. It's not a, based on a book or anything. It's just, again, this kind of big bombastic sort of action, action set piece. I think after Dune, I've just been kind of, I don't know. I mean, I think I just kept going because I feel good and, and uh, you know, uh, Michael Bay makes these movies, they're exciting, they're action. It's not my, it's not really my genre, but do you know what? He, it was, it was in the, the, in the, the pandemic in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, their action, you know, Howard Berger created a cup, you know, is an old friend of mine. He's our governor in the Academy. He, uh, KMB created a couple of the effects, a couple of corpse bodies and stuff. It was fun. It's like old fashioned, very quick makeups, not dissimilar to what I've been doing on other movies. Mm -hmm. um, you get to hone, you get to kind of revisit stuff you used to do. You're doing blood and you're running in and it's it's kind of fun. It's hard. It's, it is Bayhem. But <laughs> I have a lot of respect too, because it's very hard to make movies. I mean, I did it with Jake with The Guilty. Um, mm -hmm. but I feel like, you know what? It's very hard right now. It's been a very trying time, as you know. We've talked mm -hmm. about it. I respect that people have been trying to keep working. It's not been easy. A lot of people have suffered. Mm -hmm. I don't say we've suffered in the movie business. It's a little bit. We've, you know, right. we got tested. a lot of people didn't get tested. We got tested and we did the best we could. Our biggest sacrifice is wearing a mask. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, um, but for that, I think uh, I'm also feel very privileged that I was able to keep working during a terrible time. And so I think for that, I've got to experience new things that I wouldn't have and whether or not I would do it again. But, you know, Michael Bay, look, he knows how to make those movies and people are excited about Ambulance. Mm -hmm. They're really excited. And I, I saw the trail. I've had more people even doing press for Dune. People say, can I talk about <laughs> Moon Knight? Can we talk about Ambulance? It kind of makes me laugh. I'm like, really? Um, and so I'm very happy because everybody, you know what I love about our business is every, one person's success is another person's success. Mm -hmm. And I thought that yesterday about Dune because whether or not it's your type of film, it's it's it doesn't matter. It's good for the business. So if, if you love Dune and that's your movie, then it's great for another film because people will go back to the movies. And I, I don't care what anyone says. And and so whether it's this film or anything really, it's it's a reaffirmation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That we'll go back to the movies and we're not going to be, we're not finished. We're not done. 
yeah absolutely the, the the show goes on as they say um and uh yeah i mean that's uh you know it's crazy to think again looking back two years ago i you know i saw some of this coming but i certainly you know ambulance i mean when i heard you're working that was like that's so cool like I, I just did not expect that and of course moon night again you know it's going to be the, one of these shows that so many people are, are excited about and going to talk about and look forward to and just knowing that you know your work is going to be seen and you're contributing to those, I think is really exciting. And, and it's cool to see, you You know, kind of there's these new, there's always something new. And I think you, no matter how long, I mean, you've been doing this for, you know, a long time, but it's, it's exciting to see, um, you know, those, those different projects kind of come up and, and you get to work with new people, you get to work with some friends that you've been with a long time. So um, that's why, that's why you do it. That's why it's, it's about the work. So. It's why you um, do it. Also, I think it's being great. You get to a point where it took me, I think it's important. I try, you know, whether you're doing what I do or other crafts and artisans and, you know, everybody who's in any business, but particularly in filmmaking and TV and is that, you know, it takes a long time to gain your confidence. And it took mm -hmm. me many, many years to decide, I know what I'm doing. I'm in a position now where I, I can sort of say to somebody, no, actually, I'm not interested in that and, and tell them why, if they want to know, mm -hmm. they don't need to, know. or, you know, um, no, and I've had people say, would you be interested in this? No, not really. Um, but also to be at an age where you feel entirely comfortable in your own skin. And it takes years. And it's, it's really hard to say that when you're younger. People do say it, but it's, it's very hard to get to that. Mm -hmm. And then feel like you can share it with other people and, and have a moment where you really do say, you know what, I want to try working on that because maybe that's not my thing. You know, yeah. who would have thought I'd work on a Michael Bay movie, but I did. And you know what, apart from the COVID thing, which was really tough in LA at that particular yeah. time. And it is a little bit, you know, but it was fine. A guy, Richie, it's fine. You know, okay. he knows how to make a movie. Mm -hmm. They're different genres, but they're movies that people want to see. And I, you know, uh, it's, it's all good. You know, it's, I mean, six or seven years ago, I worked in a Vim Vendors movie. I mean, <laughs> So I, I think it's really fun to work on other things because I love films. I watch everything. I watch every Academy film possible. I really do. I mean, it's not. You're one of the, it sounds like you're one of the few potentially based on 90, what you I, hear. 90%. But the thing is just because you watch the, it's very important for people to see. It's like reading books. I don't love mm -hmm. everything, but I do feel it's important. So because now I know what I'd like to work on for the next couple of years and, mm. and however many more years I keep working, I know what would be good for me to work on, but I also know I can't revisit. And I think I said it to somebody who interviewed me was um, at a really lovely call from Mark Wahlberg, the day of the Oscar nominations. Yeah. It was really, very touching. He called to FaceTime me and it was very, it was really moving. And I realized, Oh God, if perfect storm was in 1998 or 1999, I couldn't do that film today. Physically, I couldn't do that film on the boat, right. mm -hmm. on the ship. There was no way I could do that. I would be so ill. This, like, this <laughs> movie, oh my God, for weeks on end on the Atlantic and then on the Pacific in December, there is no way. God, I just looked at the time. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we we're, for ages. We could talk for ages. Oh, of course we could. Um, and one of these days we're going to get it, get together in LA or, or somewhere and, and have a drink I would love and, that. and chat and, uh, and talk it up. I would but love that. You're very good at this, Johnny. You're really good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Donald. I really appreciate that. And it's again, great to see you. Thank you for taking the time and you're busy. Yeah. You're taking some time out of your schedule to speak with me and, and reconnect. My and pleasure. I, My pleasure. always a pleasure. So um, we'll be, we'll be in contact. We'll be touching base soon and, and stay in, staying tight. So Looking forward to hearing more, uh, you know, in the coming weeks and months about everything you're doing and looking Thanks forward for to everything. Your Thank work. you for all your support. You've been such a good friend to me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I won't hold you any longer. Go, go get to set or do whatever you got to do. And uh, we'll, we'll right. be talking soon. All right. Thanks. There you have it, folks. What an episode. The Batman, the Donald Mowat interview. Absolutely killer combo right there. Johnny, I appreciate you breaking it down with me as always. This was a fun one. Hope the, the fans, the listeners are as enthusiastic about Batman, about uh, Dune tidbits, about everything that you and Donald spoke about. Thank you to Donald again for, for always coming by the show and being so gracious with his time. And thank you to, to all our listeners out there for tuning in week in and week out. Absolutely. As always, um, you know, stay tuned. 
follow us on social media, stay up to date with all of our episodes, uh, locked in, keeping up with the news, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, like us on Facebook, Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, where you can find podcast episodes, interviews, and all types of good stuff. Um, and those accounts can be found at Inside Film Room. And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe to our newsletter, The Rewind, so you can get everything delivered to your inbox. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, Amazon, iHeartRadio. Anywhere there's a podcast, you will find us. And be sure to come back next week when Johnny and I break down the latest from Pixar, Turning Red, which begins streaming on Disney Plus March 11th. We'll see you then.